Hey, this is Lucas Fox, founding member of Motorhead with Lemmy Kilminster on Brews and Tunes with my dear friend. So please go ahead and all you listeners out there, let's have some fun. That's what it's all about. I don't know if I can swear on this channel, but you'll probably hear, hear me swear. So please bleep it out if you need to. If your ears frazzle, it's not my fault. I'm just me. So good to have you aboard. Let's go. Hello, everybody. It's the Meister from Brews and Tunes. I'm very excited, very honored today to be chatting with uh, Lucas Fox, one of the founding members of the legendary Motorhead. Uh, also uh, played in uh, War, uh, Warsaw Pact, uh, Pink Fairies, multiple bands, uh, highly influential drummer. Uh, so yeah, very, very excited to be chatting with you today, Lucas. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, my man. And uh, may Brews and Tunes have a long life and may we all have some fun because awesome. that's what it's all about and in the end you listeners out there perk up your ears this is not for the soft-hearted <laughs> excellent cheers <laughs> you're very good i'm on wine i've just been on beer so i've got onto wine uh, beer oh, on yeah. wine feeling fine is it excellent i like it wine uh, on beer get the fear so i'm doing <laughs> wine on beer <laughs> there you go nice well uh why don't we start with um kind of what you've been doing this past insane you know the, the world kind of stopped there for a bit but uh what have you been up to this this past year this past year and a half um in the in these crazy times well um two things really um one is that uh, on parole the album which i played on came out worldwide again in Oct october the 9th Oh, yeah. 2020. Oh. Right, exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> we can both do that one. Good. Well, well, send me yours over and I'll sign it happily, my friend. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, you know, keep the CD or the, the, the album, the vinyl at your place, but, but send the cover over. It's a little bit less heavy. Right. I'll, I'll give you the address off air and uh, send it over and I'll, I'll dedicate it to you. Excellent. Thank um, you. In, in full Gothic script, of course. You know. Oh, nice. Well, I love it. Into an, well, of course, you know. That's where the Gothic script of Motorhead came from, but we'll come to that in a bit. So what have I been doing for this year? Well, basically uh, everything as norm. Um, since Lemmy died, bless him, um, people suddenly woke up to the fact that there's another guy with Lemmy who started this, this band, who started this thing off, and it was me. <coughs> <coughs> Lemmy and I had been hanging out, hanging around since August, uh, 74, 1974, and so um, when he got thrown out unceremoniously with Hawkwind, the band he was in before, right. and um, so I picked him up from the airport and we went on from there, and for about two weeks he was in a sorry state, it was a car crash, it was really a car crash, but, um, and I'd never seen Lemmy so negative, you know, it was, it was quite weird, but he really thought that uh, his band was Hawkwind and uh, it never crossed his mind to have his own band. Mm. Really, seriously, it never crossed his mind. So he was gobsmacked, as they say. And um, after about two weeks of this, I, I started getting pissed off. That's my nature. <laughs> and uh, saying, oh, let me, for fuck's sake, you know, oh, I, I, can I swear? I don't know. Oh, you know. You're good. You're good. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. If not, you have to do, for beep's sakes, you know, you have yeah, to do stuff fine. like that. Your no. problem of editing problem, but it's not mine. <laughs> either way, you know, I'll speak it as I feel it. Anyway, so uh, anyway, after about a couple of weeks of this, I said, look, come on, Luke. No, I'm a drummer. I've been drumming since the age of nine. I'm not as famous as you. I haven't got, you know, the hit silver machine under my belt. I haven't got all these thousands of fans worldwide. But I think it's about time you thought about, you know, let's, let's do a band, you know. There's, two, there's already two of us, you know, we, we, we've known each other for ages now. We really got on well because we had so much in common. I mm -hmm. mean, I, don't forget, I was a 21 year old when we met at the Speakeasy in London. And, uh, and he was a 27 year old, 28 year old um, at the same time. And therefore, he'd just come out of uh, 
you know, um, Sam Gapal and the Rocking Vickers, oh, yeah. all these bands, right? And and also he'd been Hendrix's roadie for a while. That's right. And, and he'd been H Hendrix's acid dealer. <laughs> it was him who went, went and got the acid for Hendrix, you know. And uh, and Hendrix was going, oh, let me uh, go and get me some acid, will you? And so let me go off and get some acid. And he'd come back with like eight tabs of acid, you know, and he'd give them to, to Jimmy and, and Jimmy would go, Okay, group. And he, he'd swallowed five Whoa. and insists that Lemmy takes the others. Wow. So in, in one go, right? You know, so, so it's like, so uh, this does kind of explain a little bit <laughs> about something about what we're talking about here. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but uh, so, so anyway, so what have I been doing this year? Um, people started waking up to the fact there was another guy at the beginning of Motorhead apart from Lemmy. And it was us two, just the two of us, that started, um, oh yeah, peace sign, <laughs> off, peace sign. And, um, and uh, we started Motorhead together um, at this particular point in time after he'd fucked um, four of Hawkwind's wives, which made him feel a lot better because they were still out on tour. <laughs> he took his revenge, you know. And so, um, so, so yes, and... Uh, but as I say, he, he, it really hadn't crossed his mind. He still wanted to join back into Hawkwind, you know, and that, that, was, that was his obsession. And um, it's only recently that, that I've been in contact with the manager at the time of, of Hawkwind and Mot Motorhead, Doug, who's a pretty good guy, you know, to have to... Can you imagine managing something like Motorhead or Hawkwind? I mean, it's a real nightmare, complete fucking nightmare. I would imagine. <laughs> That's, so a, a lot of respect for the management uh, in this strange, you know, way. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not more pro management than I am pro musician. It's just in this particular case, managing a band like Hawkwind or Motorhead is quite a quite a big nightmare. So, oh, okay. so a lot of respect for the people who managed to do it. And uh, so anyway, so um, so here we are at the time, and um, and. Uh, Every Friday, Lemmy would go and pick up his wages in ch in check form, right? Every Friday, because that's the way it worked in, in the UK in those days. You picked up your wage. There was, you know, most people didn't have bank accounts, right? So you picked up your wages on a Friday, either in cash or in check form. And so he'd go in, you know. So, so while he was alone, when he got kicked out of Hawkwind, I picked him up from the airport. He didn't want to see anybody. No fucker. He just didn't want to see anybody. He was so he was so pissed off. He was so sick in, you know, sick in inside of him that right. he'd lost his family. You know, because Hawkwind, although, I mean, it must be said that you know Hawkwind are living in a, a different planet to Lemmy, <laughs> or Lemmy was li living on a different planet to Hawkwind, if you like. It's, it's right. the case. You know, Lemmy being a speed freak, he was up all night, and Hawkwind being acid heads and 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 potheads, it was a different 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 school, you know. I so, remember um, reading a, an interview with Lemmy years ago, and he, and, he, and he said just that. He said, you know, I got fired from Hawkwind because I was doing too many drugs. And he goes, well, it actually, it wasn't too many drugs. I just wasn't doing the right drugs. And I thought the wrong pretty, drugs. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I was doing the wrong drugs. drugs. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was pretty that's right. That's, that's exactly it. And that's, that's really what a lot of this was down to. I mean, how he joined Hawkwind. He joined Hawkwind because of a fr dear friend of mine later called Dick Mick. Dick Mick Richard Michael Davis, who is also in a class with another Richard Davis. Therefore, in, in England, in Britain, you have these nicknames. Therefore, Richard becomes Dick, right? Right. right. So Michael becomes Mick. Oh, okay. Dick Mick. I like it. <laughs> Dick Mick. So that's where Dick Mick comes from, because there were two right Richard Mike, two, two Richard Davies in the class, and he was Dick Mick, Richard Michael nice. Davis, right? So, so anyway, Dick Mick, speed freak, was living with Lemmy, or Lemmy was living with him in a squat. I mean, we're talking about Labrick Grove in the 70s, right? I mean, we're talking about Haight-Ashbury, very, very poor part of town. Um, cockroaches on the wall, sticky carpet, you know, uh, flea, fleas on the broken down mattresses. Uh, I mean, you're talking about serious uh, degradation of, of, you know, and, you know, and did, the buildings are falling apart, you know, I mean, there's, there's no two ways. This is Elaborate Grove in the 70s. It was wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Squats everywhere, um, lots of free lovers, they called it. 
Uh, but basically because most of the women were on the pill for the first time, this was new. And, uh, and of course, particularly gonorrhea and syphilis were now curable with penicillin. Right. <laughs> so free, the, you know, the summer of love and all that was also because of this. <clears throat> so, um, so there we are on Labrick Grove and, um, and Dick Mick and, and Lemmy are living in his squat. And Dick Mick was a roadie for Hawkwind. Oh, okay. And then Dick Mick bought an oscillator. Of course, unheard of then. Oscillators, what, people wore white coats and worked in, in, in laboratories with os oscillators, you know. Yeah. And Dick Mick bought an oscillator and, and started pissing about with sound. Hence the space sound that you get of Hawkwind. Uh, okay. In parallel, two streets along in the same, I mean, we're talking about Labrick Grove. Labrick Grove, we had Hawkwind, we had Yes, the band called Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I love Yes. And the band called Pink Floyd, hmm. all within two streets of each other. Wow. That's why. All wild. playing the same concerts at the same time. And Dick Mick, Dick Mick, was the first to really get stuck into something which calls synthesized sound in the world. Wow. Right. So Dick Mick gets, Dick Mick's playing this gig with Hawkwind and one of the musicians leaves and is not available for that particular gig. So Dick Mick goes, here yeah, Lem, I think you should come on the bus and go and do this gig, right? And then he goes, oh, all right, okay then, all right, off we go, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and they're on the bus and of course, uh, Del Detmar, who's driving, one of Hawkwind's founder members, Turns around and says, uh, uh, okay, let me, uh, listen, you're playing bass, right? And let me goes, what do you mean I'm playing bass? I've got my guitar with me. And, and uh, Del goes, no, no, you're playing bass. He goes, oh, I haven't got a bass. And he goes, it's okay, we've got, we got bass in the boot. It's no problem. We've got bass in, sorry, the trunk. Okay. Trunk. We're talking in Ohio. <laughs> so we need to talk American English, not English English. So, so it's a trunk. Okay, they, they, They've got a bass in the trunk. And uh, this is how Lemmy started playing bass. Wow. He'd never played wow. bass before. I had no idea. That's interesting. And Lemmy was a rhythm guitarist. Huh. Now, when Lemmy and I started hooking up in 74, we kind of mingled where, where our influences came from. And one of them, from my point of view as a drummer, was Keith Moon. Oh, yeah. And from his point of view as a bass player was John Entwistle, the ox. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. You know, Boris the Spider, right. my generation. Dun, 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 dun. No, Boris, you know, my generation for fuck's sake. We're talking about serious bass sound. Yeah. You mix that with a rhythm guitarist and you start to get the notion of where Lemmy's style came from. Interesting. So it's dun, 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 dun. Plus, you know, all that, all that chord stuff. So, so you've got this style, which is in Lemmy, which comes from the fact he wasn't a bass player. Right. He was a rhythm, rhythm guitar player. Interesting. And not just any rhythm guitar player. His obsession, like my obsession, one of these things which had us joined together from the first night in 74, in August 74, late at night when we ran into each other via motorcycle Irene who introduced us who was a dear friend of mine and who knew Lemmy and she goes Lemmy this is Lucas Lucas this is Lemmy and Lemmy goes hi Lou you know first and ever time that somebody called me Lou and I let him and uh, and there we are the two of us spending the night our first night of many 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 nights together um, and realising that we had the same musical tastes, we had the same taste in women, and the same respect for women. Very important. Yeah. Very important. Uh, Le Lemmy, despite these interviews where he says, oh, I fucked 2,000 women, who's counting? In the end, he was extremely respectful towards women, you know, and he loved his mother like I love my mother, and, and there was no mach machismo there. Right. This, this is important. This is very important to under start understanding the man and, and me as well. And I was extremely well educated by women, you know, at the age of 14, I was going out with a girl of 16 who really educated me as to 
you know, what women like in bed and what, how women like to be treated. Right. You know, these, these are things that, frankly, you know, it, it should be taught at school, you know, to right. make the world a better place. You know? I agree. I love it. And, uh, and so, so, so there's me and Lem. And we're going, uh, I'm going, so, well, MC5? And he's going, yeah, back in USA, yeah. Okay, kick out the jams, you motherfuckers. Right, okay. Yeah. And, and we're sort of, you know, kicking off on these sort of, the birds with Ronnie Wood. Uh, the yeah. English birds, not the American birds, right? And leaving here, the track. Um, and we're kicking in on the Stooges and uh, um, all these bands, Link Ray, you know, the Rumble, you know. It, we're, we're sort of picking, we're, we're buzzing off each other. We're buzzing to and fro. And, uh, and then we start talking about another obsessive subject, the Second World War. Hmm. Yeah. Now, because, because, well, I'm a lad who was born in 1953. He was born in 1945. Okay, so there's a bit of a difference between us. I'm much younger and much less experienced. But we've both been obsessed by the Second World War from a very, very early age. Partly, he was living close to Liverpool. One third of Liverpool was destroyed during the war. Right, yeah. In, in London, we had a thousand people dead a night in the Blitz. A thousand people dead in the night. We're not talking about 9-11 here. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. You know, I mean, seriously, you know, yeah. uh, and I, I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing 9-11 at all. I'm not saying that's, that's not, you know, it's not, I'm not comparing. I'm just saying, understand the psyche. Yeah, it's a lot of people. When I was walking down the street as a kid, every single road in London had two, three, four bomb sites. Every single one of them is the, is the blitz, you know. And, and people dying all the time, people being maimed, people losing their limbs, people ending up in hospital, and taking your neighbours who you hated, having, having them come and live with you because they got bombed out. Right. So we're talking about post-war Britain. And post-war Britain is a very strange place, <clears throat> which suddenly there's no class. There's no class situation hmm. because everybody's the same under the bombs. Right. Um, the lords and ladies, or the, rather the ladies, because all, the, all the, the men are scattered across the world trying to defend some stupid empire, right? <laughs> right. And, uh, and the women are all in the factories and driving ambulances and, and working their asses off like they did in the First World War. Right. Because there was no option. Because, you know, you remember America didn't come into the war until 1917, the First World War. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'd, all, we, we'd already lost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of men, you know, and, and like there's a French had, etc. I mean, you know, we're talking about a real massacre. Second World War, same sort of deal, you know. America came in after having bombed Pearl Harbor, after having, you know, Pearl Harbor, you know. So, yeah. so, so I'm not being anything no, here. No, this I'm is just this stating is... this is historical facts, you know. Yeah, exactly. Therefore, therefore, this is part of how... Um, a lot of people, not like Michael say, Michael Kay would say, not a lot, not, not a lot, lot of people knows, but this is partly how when people ask me or ask people, they go, well, why is it that so many rock bands come from Britain? How, how come Britain keeps churning out these different rock bands? Hmm. They're not all copying each other. Right. They're all very, very individualistic. Now, it started in the Second World War because all the men were nowhere to be seen. They're either on RAF bases, the Air Force bases, or they were scattered across in Africa, in Burma, you know, in India, like my father, you know, all over the world, right? And the women were at home and, of course, working in the factories, driving ambulances, fire trucks, all that stuff. And the kids, the young kids at the time, are playing in these bombed out houses. Right. Because they've got no parental control at all. So these, they're these wild kids in all these towns, London, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, Plymouth, etc. You've got all the, the major towns of Britain have been bombed. Bombed right. the fuck out of them. So these kids are kind of left to their own devices. And they're picking up watches and doing black market trade and, and buying and selling from what they're getting in the bomb sites. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like kind of a bit Blade Runner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a bit of that vibe, you know. And, of course, we've got the British weather. And, of course, it's blackout. There's no street lighting. 
you're not allowed to have any light showing outside your building as soon as the sun goes down. Yeah, it can be a target. Therefore, we've got, we got blackout, what's called blackout, where every single window is blacked out. And with air raid ward wardens going around the streets, blowing their whistles, saying, Oi, we can see a crack, a crack of light. Wow. That can tell Jerry where we are. To not show the Germans, the Nazis, not the Germans, the Nazis, where London is. To give them no clues, right? So you can imagine living in the dark from 4.30 in the afternoon, in, you know, from November, November through March or March or April. You're living in the dark. So, so, so begin to imagine the atmosphere of that place. Yeah. And that's where these kids are beginning to come to life. These youngsters and their, their elder brothers, the young, younger brothers. Now, in the younger brothers, they started creating things called skiffle groups. Oh, because yes. when, when America started coming into the war, and started coming to Britain, basically in, in, in 1942, 1943, you know, we've been going since 39, right? And um, so the Americans came over and had a lot of money compared to us. So, so it was, uh, I mean, one of the things that they used to say was oversexed, overpaid, and over here, <laughs> right? And of course, the women, there weren't enough men to go around already. Right. And sudden, suddenly there's all these Canadian, American, Polish, Yugoslav, French, etc. Foreign troops and particularly foreign air forces. It all started with the air forces, right? Right. So, so my, mo my mother was, was in the WAF, which is the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. Oh, okay. So this is one of the obsessions where, where I understand this shit. And um, so, so, so you begin to sort of put all that together. And you look into the early 50s, there were 225,000 skiffle groups in the UK. Wow. I had no 225,000. That's wild. Right, because all you needed was an acoustic guitar, a broomstick with one string as the bass, and, and some uh, darning needle, uh, darning thimbles, you know, those things you put on your end of your fingers. Yeah. They're metal things, right? Right. And, and a washboard. <laughs> which is your percussion. So, so the, uh, thousands of these, all the kids were going on it because the Americans arrived with their 78s, which were their, their records. Yeah. Right? With all sorts of blues stuff and, you know, and, 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 and Glenn Miller and all this stuff. Wonderful, an explosion of talent. And, and so you're getting these imitations and the beginnings of rock and roll started there. But of course, these British youngsters, they didn't want to do the same as each other because there's so many of them. Right. There's so many of them. They had to be, every single one of them had to be different. It's like the difference between Chuck Berry and Little Richard. Yeah, yeah. You know, Little Richard and, I don't know, MC5, whatever. You know, I mean, you're talking about, we all had the same influences, but everyone's radically different. So you haven't got all these bands copying each other. They're all trying to be different from each other. <laughs> now, that's where you get this, 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 um, this spirit. You know, I mean, the Stones, you know, the Stones were obsessed by the blues and R&B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. But they, they swallowed it and had it going through their pores and spat it out in a different way. Right. Yeah. They came out with a different angle on this, which still had the blues, the, the desperation of the blues. But it was different. Yeah. The Beatles, Carl Perkins, all the country stuff, and also the Little Richard, you know, Long Tall Sally, all that stuff. And Chuck Berry, of course, you know, like Keith. But, but again, spat it out with these fucking amazing harmonies, those three-part harmonies. Nobody ever heard that before. Yeah. Exactly. Why? Because... Those, those boys were in Hamburg for three years running. They went back to Hamburg, to Star Club. Star Club in Hamburg, one of Lemmy's obsessions and my obsessions, early Beatles. They were playing five sets a night, my friend. Five sets a night, That's an it. hour and 20 every set. Jeez. 400 songs that they were playing, 400 covers. A night. And night. That is crazy. <laughs> but you I imagine mean, their fingers. 
Yeah. And so what were they on? <laughs> Pervertine. Uh, a thing called Pervertine. Pervertine was the Nazi speed. Oh, okay. Which they gave to the stormtroopers, which they gave to the, the Blitzkrieg, they gave to the Air Force, they gave to the tank commanders. The whole of Germany, Nazi Germany, invaded Europe on Pervertine. Interesting. I had no idea. At the end of the, at the, end of the war, they were still on Pervertine. It made them cheerful. It also made them fearless. It also made them completely fanatic. Right. Like amphetamine sulfate can as well. Very, very similar drug. So they have most of Germany on pervertine because they started off in the Spanish Civil War in 1936, testing it out on the pilots. It worked really well. So when 1939 comes along and they start invading well, the Sudetenland, and then, of course, Austria, and then Czechoslovakia, and then Poland, and then um, Holland, Belgium, France. They did that in a matter of weeks. Yeah. Because they're all out of their brains on perverting. Interesting. And not sleeping for 72 hours. Oof. Fourth day, five day marathon. <laughs> Sounds familiar? Yeah. <laughs> right. So... So Lemmy and Speed is also linked to the Beatles and Speed and the Who and Speed. Right. right. The Who and the Beatles and Stones at the beginning in, this, in the early 60s, 62, 63, were playing two concerts a night. The Beatles were used to it because since 59, 60, they'd been in Hamburg playing five sets a night. Yeah. And sleeping with prostitutes and, and sleeping behind the screen of this all night porn pornographic cinema. That's where they slept. Wow. So, so when everyone says, oh, the Beatles are a pop band, the boys band, you say, it's, excuse the fuck out of me. <laughs> Ringo, Ringo came from the toughest part of Liverpool, which apart from the Gorbals in Glasgow, was the toughest place in Europe. Right, yeah. I mean, you're talking about much tougher than Chicago or the Bronx or whatever. Right, yeah. You're talking about real cutthroat. When my, my father was a boy, he was born in 1914, so when he was 11 or something, the policeman used to walk around in fours because it was so dangerous. Wow. We're not talking about people walking around in bowler hats and being gentlemen in, in Britain, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because people have that, that, you know, it's, it's oh, it's okay, it's the Avengers, it's, you know, Steed yeah. and, and Mrs. Steed and... Uh, but no, it's it's a very dangerous place, and we've got a lot of gangsters. We've got the Cray brothers in London, who are famous for nailing people's hands to tables, you know, and, and putting a nail to someone's neck and stuff. You know, I mean, you're not talking about friendly people. It's it's right. it's Al Capone time as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so so there's a lot of that going down. So so just just to kind of put you in in the ambiance as to where Lemmy and where I was coming from. This music thing that we're obsessed by, it was obsessed by British R&B, British blues, which was, we loved American R&B, we loved American blues, we loved MC5, but MC5 were an incredibly different band for America. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, America had really all these neat, neat, really neat, polished bands, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we know how to play. We went to Buckley School of Music. Well, hey, well, we, uh, we do a paradiddle this way and a paradiddle that way. And hey, little, 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 don't have the same ability to play but they're playing from the seat of their pants they're playing with their balls and they're playing with their their guts yeah you know it's uh, yeah. which is of course why we love chuck berry why we love little richard who became incredibly polished in what they did but what we love about them is of course nadine you know nadine what a great track you know i mean yeah. incredible words it's yeah. wordsmith galore the kinks, the same sort of thing. You've got the kinks who are writing Waterloo Sunset and Dead End Street and all these tracks. They're, they're little cameos 
of history. So, so, so Lemmy and I were kind of all based in this shit. Second World War, this sort of creation, the sort of women we had around who were wonderful, wonderful women. Um, this pervertine stuff, uh, the Beatles in Hamburg, um, Hawkwind, Pink Fairies, Pink Floyd, um, and yes, Hawkwind and Pink Fairies, radically anti-establishment. Right. I mean, radically anti-establishment, more so than the Stones. You know, the Stones were pretty anti-establishment, but you know, and even the Beatles were very anti-establishment. You know, I mean, the Beatles wrote the first first original track that Stones recorded was a Beatles song. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I yeah. read it before. That's right. Yeah, you know, because because Andrew Lou Goldham, who was the Beatles' publicist, um, became the Stones' manager at the age of nineteen. Wow. He signed the Stones, and he became also their equivalent of Phil Spector, the producer. Andrew Andrew Luke Oldham was obsessed by Phil Spector. He loved him. He's great. You know, Phil Spector, the Crystals, the Ronettes. You know, it's fucking yeah. amazing. You know, the Wall of Sound. You yeah, know, I oh, can yeah. an attorney, River Deep, Titan, River Deep Mountain High. We're talking about serious production, and he had that that gift of the the ear, the lugol, the ear, and he managed to actually record the stones so that they sounded radically different from what they wanted to sound like. They wanted to sound exactly the same as Muddy Waters. Right. Or Big Grill Brunzi or John Lee Hooker. But Andrew knew that they, they didn't have that, that, I mean, the stones, I mean, Jagger went to the London School of Economics for fuck's sake, <laughs> which paid him very well long term. Yeah. But he was, he, he was, uh, I wouldn't say he was a posh kid, but he, was, he certainly wasn't like Ringo or, or John or Paul or George. Right. You know, and, and even Keith Richards, who was from what you'd call a working class family, it's, he was nevertheless an art school student. Sa same as John was, John Lennon was for a while as well, you know. And Pete Townsend was, and I was, but but the art school thing—it's it's like we all went into art school because we could get away with not having to get a job for another right. two or three years, right. <laughs> right. Right. and and we could probably get a grant to actually go and study there, to have a tiny bit of pocket money, and actually have the the art school paid for it. So remember, we are in the fifties and sixties, and it's uh, the whole of Europe has to survive; it has to keep people alive. Now, in the States, they, 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 they made so much money off the First and Second World War that as a result, the States was booming. And therefore this, this American dream could happen on the backs of other things such as the slaves who built the States. Yeah. And, and also, you know, the First and Second World War in Europe where they, they got so much money out of it. In, in, in reparation, in, in, you know, for investing, for actually putting their army in, in, into the field for, for one year. Yeah. They got fortunes out and they got a, a part of the, the Versailles Treaty, you know, which of course was, you know, a French treaty and an allied treaty, which in fact created Hitler. You know, so, so all of these things are linked to how you get these bands. Right, right. You know, it's like Jim Morrison's father was an admiral, I believe. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, that's right. Right? Now, that was also because he was rebellious against his father. We were rebellious against what was the previous thing of, oh, you know, we came out of here. I mean, it was, it was a close call, you know. Um, people tend to forget that it was a really close call. We lost 340,000 merchant sailors in the Atlantic because of the U-boats. Right right hundreds of thousands of tons of shipping went down into the, the atlantic which now all of that shipping we ended up paying for that we the british ended up paying for that on a lease deal ended up paying for the, we finished paying for that like 10 12 years ago wow yeah that's crazy <laughs> yeah so, so, so you, I mean, this is, this is pure capitalism, which in, in Feeney, I'm not against, I'm not a communist or anything, 
but I am a per person of the people. And, and I don't believe in, in, you know, I believe in, you've got to look after your people, otherwise right. sooner or later you get a revolution, you know? Yeah. And, and if you can't find jobs and, and create jobs for people, well, you're going to have a problem sooner or later. So anyway, you've got it slight split into popular, you know, politics for a second. <laughs> it, excuse me. That's so it. It, 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 it it's, it's part of the parcel. Yeah, it's where, all together. In 1973, the year before Lemmy and I met, we had a thing called the oil crisis worldwide. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the price of oil shot up. The price of vinyl, all the records, doubled. Suddenly in Britain, for the first time since the Second World War, we had massive unemployment. I mean, massive unemployment. We had power strikes in 74, where all the offices were working on candlelight. Wow. And the workforce was on a three day week mm. out of seven. So suddenly you've got this massive amount of kids who haven't got a job, who have no money, no future. They are born to lose. <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> now you're beginning to get the grip of it. Therefore, you imagine these kids, what they're seeing at the moment is all these bands, yes, Genesis, the Beatles, the Stones, etc. They've got these mansions, they've got these Rolls Royces. They're earning fucking fortunes, even though they're being taxed up to here. Right. They're still earning lots of money. And these kids are going, nah, that's not me, mate. That's not me. I can't see it. I, I can't identify with these, these guys. Right. In the hippie days, in the 60s, everyone going, oh, it's all cool, man. You know, Neil Young, Crosby, Nat Stills, Nash and Young. Nobody really thought about the fact they were earning shitloads of money. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, really, yeah. I mean, good. I mean, good for them. And, you know, I'm not I'm nothing against earning money out of music. Far from it. On the contrary. It's part of the problem with the Internet at the moment is everybody suddenly thought that music should be for free. Yeah. 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 And, and the bottom dropped out of the music business and suddenly... Everybody, the only way you can earn money out of music is going on the road and, you know, we're back into the Dickensian times. We're back to being yeah. troubadours. Right. You know, because we can't make any money out what we recorded. It's all got dr driddling down, you know, Deezer and Spotify and streaming. You know, it's, it's nonsense. So anyway, I told you it would probably last more than an hour, didn't I? <laughs> but but so, so there we are in 1973, 1974. A good part of the population is unemployed. A lot of that unemployment is also working class. And they're looking for an, something different. Right. What explodes on the scene? It's this mixture of Hawkwind and the Pink Fairies. Now, the record companies, they, they thought, Hawkwind, we're making good money out of Silver Machine, stuff like that. Pink Fairies, similar sort of band, Okay, they're anti-establishment, but we know how to deal with it. It's going to be cool. It's space rock, hippie rock. But no. This fucking weird thing happened. Me and Lemmy, and when we got Larry, and we wanted, we wanted Wayne Kramer from MC5 originally. Oh, really? Oh, that would have oh, been. Oh, yeah. Fun. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, Lemmy knew him and stuff. But that, that was the original idea. And, uh, and then we found Larry, and we wanted Luther Grosvenor, who is uh, Ariel Bender in Mott the Hoople. Okay, yeah. And, uh, you know, Luther Grosvenor's Spooky Tooth, right? Yeah. And so, so the idea was a double guitar thing. But short, sharp shock. Three and a half minute songs. This isn't a 10 minute song with a 20 minute guitar solo, right. a 10 minute drum solo on the end of it. This is short, sharp shock shit. This is back to the original rock and roll format, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, 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 it's not like the original rock and roll format. This, this is tearing into the audience an incredible volume. This is, this is, um, this is taking no prisoners. Yeah. This, and, and, and the kids loved it. Uh, kids, that's, that sounds terrible. The audience loved it. The Hawkwind and the Pink Fairies audience were gobsmacked. <laughs> I I, I, the first gig I can remember it like it was yesterday at the Roundhouse 
in Chalk Farm, London. And as we came on stage and started up the first number, the whole audience was like, <laughs> shock. <laughs> well, I mean, because yeah, that, that time. Three changed. or four numbers in, three or four numbers in, they were going, hey, wait a minute, this is City Kids. We know City Kids from the Pink Fairies, or, you know, this is Silver Machine. We know, but it sounded completely different. It was right. twice as fast. It was much more violent. It was 10 times as loud. Yeah. yeah. And there we were with this image, with these leather jackets, you know, drain, cut, drain pipe jeans, cowboy boots, bullet belts, um, you know, Nazi regalia on our thing, which is anti-establishment, nothing to do with the Nazis. Right. Lemmy was never a Nazi, would never ever have been a Nazi. He was a, basically a feminist and very into women and very into all sorts of races. Some of his favorite bands were Little Richard, etc. You know, I mean, no Ch Chuck Berry, of course, you know, I mean, right. there's no way Lemmy was a fascist or a Nazi. Yeah, definitely. But we were anti-establishment. And the most shocking thing we could find was some of the Nazi regalia. Yeah, yeah. And, and wearing that was shocking. Now, just think about it. We are in May, June, 75. We went round, the, round Britain in this tour. Ended up Rockfield Studios to record that album, which I'll come back to in a minute. There we are. As we went round Britain, bit by bit, suddenly bullet belts are appearing in the crowd. Hmm. Leather jackets. Nobody wore leather jackets in those days, apart from bikers. Right, yeah. And they were kind of this little community which was a part, you know. It's like little clubs, you know, of bikers. But the main, you know, it's hippies everywhere. Yeah. Mods everywhere. You know, flower power. You know, fuck it, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I mean, seriously, everybody expressing themselves in their own way and wearing weird hats and floppy, floppy hats and scarves and velvet dungarees and you know it's just wonderful right. expression but suddenly there we are and there's this band on stage which looked different mirror shades bullet belts cowboy boots nazi regalia leather jackets and an attitude yeah a real fuck you attitude yeah and that's what the kids needed that's what the audience needed the public needed and suddenly in every You'd call them bathrooms in the straight states. How can you call it a bathroom when there's no <laughs> bath? Anyway, that's just another subject. Uh, but anyway, the bathrooms were, were like four, four to a booth sniffing, sniffing amphetamine sulfate suddenly, you know? Right. And the girls were like semi-undressed. And, and we were talking about summer of 75, a very hot summer. And, and this, this is starting to really take off. And it's radically different to what else was going on. And this is... This band, Mark One, Motorhead Mark One, is, if you like, the bridge, the bridging band between progressive rock, space rock, all that stuff, you know, pop, prog rock, right. you know, pomp rock, you know, all that jam rocks, hippie rock, and punk and metal. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's like six months before punk. Yeah. Then you got. Vivian, now Dame Vivian Westwood, who I adore, and Malcolm McLaren, who I adore a little bit less, who pick up on all these same images, the red and the black, the swastikas, the torn clothes, the bondage, the black leather jackets, etc. Suddenly they're picking up on it and running with it for punk. Yeah. Because the punks love Motorhead. Tony James, Generation X, Zig Zig Sputnik. Brian James, The Damned, Tans the Youth, um, all these people who I knew really well, who uh, Mick Jones, The Clash, um, Joe Strum, etc. They all came to those first gigs, Motel yeah. gigs. And you look at their biographies, they all go, oh, well, I saw a Hawkwind gig and a Pink Fairies gig and then Motorhead. I knew I had to do a band. I had to make a band from there on. Right, right. So it's, it's, it's this crystallization. I'm not really, so, I'm not so really saying, Oh, me and Len, we were super. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it's a colli colliding situation. Yeah. 
you know, a geopolitical situation mixed with a musical situation with, you know, all this progressive rock and long guitar solos and rather a bit getting a bit pompous, to be honest. Oh, yeah. The music, music business getting very fat and complacent, yeah. to be honest, you know. Um, and suddenly we've got this, you know, the oil crisis and these kids on the dole, the dole um, um, unemployment benefit, you know, which I, I know is a bit strange there, but, you know, at least they had 12 pounds a week. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. You know, which is like $12 a week. Right, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and living in squats and shit. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting, so, so, so it's, it's a whole geopolitical. And of course, you've got the fashion element, just like you did in the early 60s with Mary Quant and Bieber and, and um, Liechtenstein and Warhol. And, you know, picking up on the things from Marcel Duchamp linked through the Sex Pistols, you know, Marcel Duchamp and his urinal. Yeah. He said, yeah. This, is, this is art, right? That's like the Sex Pistols, yeah, and Motorhead. You know, I mean, it, it's it's they're all linked. You always got these three or four layers in history. You know, music, fashion, yeah, geopolitics, well, geopolitics. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, you, poetry, you, yeah. Kerouac, <laughs> Kerouac, Burroughs, yeah, you know, Jack Kerouac, Burroughs, Hunter S. Thompson. You know, and and there there we go again. You and it's 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 all linked. You know, right? Yeah. Well, the, the cool thing, I mean, you you and Lemmy, you know, I mean, you really changed the game in a lot of ways, especially at that time, what was happening, you know, like you said, I mean, it was, it was very different than anything anybody had seen. It was dirty, you know, it was built off of, you know, like you said, you know, the blues and the R&B of, of the, the 1960s, but it was a dirtier version of that and an angry oh, yeah, version dirty, of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, much it was really cool. And it, much yeah, it more changed, dangerous. Yeah, yeah, and totally changed the game. Changed, you know, as you we, said. We, you know, we, were, we were riding a razor blade, you know? We yeah. were riding a razor blade. When right. we got on stage, it, it, it was, uh, it, it, it really got out there because that's the thing that, that the, the, the audience loved as well. It wasn't just the volume. It was always all, also the fact, listen, I'll ask you a very simple question. Why do you like to go and see live bands as opposed to just watch a video? Oh, yeah. I mean, just that energy. And because something can go wrong. Yeah, that's true. That's Some, true. Something can die. You know, something can die on stage. It's, it, it's a calamity, the, the disaster factor. Yeah. The fact true. that it's living on the edge. Now, any band that doesn't play with that, well, frankly... I told you before we started talking about this, I was going to tell you something about this. Lemmy and I, I am still very old school. <coughs> Even now, when I get on stage, I am, my job, my, my vocation is to get the audience off. Mm. Yeah. I'm not there to show you my paradiddles. Buddy Rich style. I'm not there as a performing dog in a circus. I'm there to get you off, right. to get your dick up, to get <laughs> that, that fucking communion with the audience, to right. get them off. You, bless you, love you all, all you people out there that pay for that ticket. They make this possible. Right. Without you, there is no fucking band on stage. Yeah, yeah. You are what it's all about. It's those fans out there. And Lemmy and I have always been a hundred thousand percent of that. And it's, it's, it's very old school. We are called entertainers. You need to be larger than life and it's complete respect for the audience. And then you take your audience with you and you take them somewhere else. And you take for a couple of hours, that audience is in another space and time. Right. right. And that's what it's about. And when somebody buys a fucking album, they want that. They don't want some, 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 I mean, they, a lot of people love that, the, 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 the perfect album, which is also prettily arranged and stuff. I love that too. You know, I, I mean, for fuck's sake, so as I walk off stage, some, even now, some people will say, uh, Lucas, who is the greatest drummer in the world? I just look at them like they're fucking mad. Like, I can't think like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> How can you compare Hendrix to Beethoven? Yeah. Or, Mo or Mozart to Clapton? 
or fast Eddie to, to Segovia. You cannot. Right. Chuck Berry to Little Richard to, you know, keep going. <clears throat> Thank fuck the arts are not about who is the greatest. Yeah. That's a sports mentality. Yeah. That yeah. is who who did the <clears throat> oh in, in the Super League we got uh, 72 this and 72 that and 45 runnings this way and 45 runnings this way and 25 blockings and it's all fucking mathematical shit and it's 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 it's, it's like this mental thing of who is better who is not so good who's better who's worse it's dualism yeah in the arts the beauty of the arts is that you and I my brother can go listen I love a lot of what Motorhead did, but I also love a lot of what the Beatles did. I also love a lot of what the Stones did. And guess what? Abba, Abba made a few fucking good tracks, and Fleetwood Mac, the American version, did some good tracks too, and so did Fleetwood Mac, the blues band in Britain do. Yeah. Yeah, and you suddenly start thinking, I'm free. Yeah. yeah. I don't have to... I mean, okay, I'm wearing black. I, I wear my uniform, and I believe in it. I don't lose, lose the faith. But Lemmy was a big fucking Beatles fan. Right. This is not an accident of, 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 of nature. It's part of the fundamental root of the thing. Yeah. yeah. Girls' school. Girls' school. Them playing with girls' school. The fact that Lemmy loved Joni Mitchell. Oh, yeah. Excuse me? Joni Mitchell. <laughs> Caught and spark. The sound of her vocals. You listen to early, early Motorhead stuff, you can hear Lemmy singing. Not, <clears throat> we got so loud and the foldback hadn't caught up with us. Because up until then, okay, this is a technical job. We'll do a quick technical five minutes, all right? Okay. The Beatles went on stage. I saw them when I was 12, all right? Oh, wow. Uh, no, 11, December 1964, at the Hammersmith Odeon, ha ha, ha ha. Haha, <laughs> where That's else? Cool. No sleep till houses, the fucking people, cool. right? And uh, and there they were on stage. The whole audience was an average age of 13 to 15. 80% girls, hysterical, <laughs> standing on the seats, losing it and pissing themselves. <laughs> rivers of piss running towards the stage <laughs> literally the whole place smelt of piss this is amazing but the beatles were incredible those three-part harmonies you know as soon as the, 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 the screams died down a fraction you heard it they were fucking amazing a great band live they kicked ass they were just brilliant absolutely brilliant so the beatles i saw the stones there i saw I can Tina Turner there. I saw Chuck Berry there. I saw you know, all my early years were swallowing this stuff. Oh, and, and all the, the blues bands and the, and the stacks when stacks came over, Otis Redding, you know, um, or you know, that whole that whole stacks tour um, and, and the Motown tour. The Motown came over and it had, it had been under publicized. And the guy who was, who was um, convincing Barry, Barry Gordon to bring Motown, Motown over, convinced Barry Gordon, he's like, they're great, they're big here, you see? And they came over and they played Hammersmith Odin half full. <gasps> <laughs> the Motown guys called it the ghost tour because there were no audience. Wow. But it's fucking amazing. You, there's a great little documentary if you want to get into that. But anyway, this is what this is the, the life that we're talking about. We're talking about the 60s, the early 60s. Listen, I went down to the youth club, youth club in Chiswick, because we'd run out of money and we were no, no longer living in central London. We're in Chiswick, in the suburbs, which, you know, I mean, in those days, people used to live in the centre, you know. They yeah. still, still do to some extent. The centre was expensive. And um, we had this youth club, a youth club where... You know, like it's, I guess, uh, what do you call them? The, the housing estates, the, uh, the, it's not the prospects. It's, you know, on the edge of towns, you have- Oh, these, like the, the projects or? The projects, projects. That's what I'm looking for. So you've got the projects and stuff and all these skinheads and, and, and you know, like rockers and, you know, they're, they're young 12, 13, 14 year old kids who are a bit rough on the edges, right? 
And I see this spotty kid covered in spots, you know, real acne, with bright red hair, short. And he puts a record on. Dang, 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 dang. People try to put us down <laughs> my generation. And bang! You know, and you're sort of going, fuck. I haven't heard anything like this since um, you look like an angel. <laughs> you walk like a, you know, Elvis, the explosion when I got wise, you're the devil in this. You know, this is the explosion. It hits you in the guts. It hits you the fucking, it smacks you in the face. It gives you a headbutt. Right. And suddenly my generation hit home. And that guitar, that bass solo, dum diddle dum diddle dum diddle dum dum pure Lemmy. Yeah. Pure Lemmy. And there I am at the age of whatever it is, 13 at this youth club playing ping pong and stuff. And I, I swear, the ball whizzed past, past, past my ear and my <laughs> generation was on. And it was just like, there was no ping pong going, going there's nothing going on in my head apart from Keith yeah. Moon, Entwistle, Townsend, Daltrey. It was just, and Daltrey stuttering like that. Right. And make, making a, a proud moment about someone who stuttered. Yeah. Well, it all, fuck off no fade away of course you know, it's that danger it's that danger again yeah riding the edge of the wave you know and toto i love toto they're wonderful you know there's all these bands of like, they're beautiful i work with james brown as well i work with ray charles i work with shit loads of people yeah. and it's all so slick it's beautiful but i prefer you know ray charles what i say when it was first written and stuff, it's right, right on the edge. Yeah. You know, the Ray Lex are just, whoa, what? You know, and you know, and he's still a fucking junkie. I'm not saying anything good about junkie. Please don't get me wrong. I will not sell you taking drugs is good. I will not, because most people don't have the metabolism to be able to put up with this shit. Yeah, yeah. And Lemmy died recently at the age of 70. It's fucking sad because he could have maybe live to a hundred and, and still be <laughs> back yeah. in a way, you, yeah. know? you know what I mean? You know, it's, it's kind of, you know, and, and he said, I, I, you know, he didn't want to live forever. Of course he didn't, of course he didn't. But I was with him towards the end in, well, you know, I'll, I'll show you, look. We are on, you know, look this. Can you see that? Oh yeah, nice. Oh yeah, I love it. Very cool. Okay, and in the top right hand corner, it says LK. Can you see that? Yeah. Let me kill, kill Mrs. Guest List. Oh, ah, okay, cool. That's my backstage pass. Last time we were together. And we spent two and a half hours, three hours together. Nice. In, in Paris. Very cool. And, and, you know, it was amazing. It was fucking amazing. It was just like right at the beginning in 1974. We were back to those same, same two geezers. <coughs> he was well sick by then. He was well yeah. sick by then. Well, you even yeah. played, uh, you played with him, uh, you played with Motorhead on their 10 year anniversary in 85, right? Well, play. Uh, Are you I had fun there? playing a, a white Stratocaster, yes. Oh, you played I had a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, yeah. I did not know. They, that. Did, they didn't give me a drum kit, so. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You know, that's that's so okay. Awesome. It's okay. I, I think Pete Gill or, or whatever it was and, and Filthy were at one drums and stuff. But uh, f for that, they gave me a white Stratocaster and plugged it in, the fools. Oh. So, 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 do you know Adrian Ballou? Yes, yeah, I love, I'm a big King Crimson fan, uh, yeah, Talking Heads, his solo work, yeah, great stuff. So, so me, I, I just thought, you give me a good fucking guitar and a pick, okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, so I, I roared up and down the frets and stuff. I had a great time. And, and uh, <laughs> they're a bit shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck them if they can't take a joke. You know, they gave me a guitar, they got it, you know. So, so anyway, so we had a great night after. But, you know, the two nights we played there, we had a great time afterwards. It was a great night. Really was seriously funny. But, um, but, but they, yeah, yeah, we, we played together. But as I say, I played with it, you know. <laughs> nice. I was going to ask yeah, you. I wasn't, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't drumming on that. I wanted to ask you. So, uh, when this wonderful album, the On Parole, which you know is the very first Motorhead album, when, when this was re-released uh, in 2020, 
Um, fortunately, so I guess in 1979, when it was when it was originally released as the fourth album, um, unfortunately, all of the your drumming had been overdubbed by by Filthy. But with this re-release, it actually has more of your original drumming on it, which is great. But I've always wondered: is there is there somewhere is there some way to find it a bootleg with all of you drumming? Is that available? Okay, okay. Does that exist? Uh, I will. I will do a typical, typical um, no, Norman answer, or, a, or or even a German answer, or even the Italian answer, which is "jein," which is "ja" and "nein," yes and no. Okay. And I will take you across the room to my drum kit, and here we are with my beautiful Gretsch drum kit here. Oh, nice. You can see uh, it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Very cool. Okay. With my original Zildjian symbols, which are beautiful. Now, the snare drum sounds like this. Okay. You hear that? Bing. Yeah. Okay. I hit it in the center. You still got the bing, bing. Larry Wallace used to call that his the clune. Okay. Lucas's clune. Okay. Dave Edmonds, the producer, loved my clune because it meant that that cut through the sound without having to use too much volume on the snare drum. Ah, uh, okay. Therefore, the bass and guitar and vocals sounded much more powerful because the snare drum was still cutting through. Right. It had the clue. It wasn't a dead snare drum going crack. Right. Okay. It was kind of years later, they started putting a lot of reverb on the snare. Drum. You know? So, when Warner's sent me the masters, the remastered versions of this, I listened to it and I went, hang on a minute. Of course that clune is still there. Mm. There's two drummers on this album. Yeah. And on the original, it's not just Lost Johnny. Do you know why? Because in those days, we didn't have a drum booth. Oh uh, yeah, so you're playing live, basically. With We're the... playing pretty much live with, with two, three sets of overheads, Neumanns, Neumanns, I love Neumanns, right? overheads all the way down the studio to get that big fat sound yeah cool so that sound the ambient sound is picking up the drums the bass and the guitar now think about it filthy comes in and overdubs but we are talking technical here it is an overdub you're right on top of what exists already now, the speed was so fucking strong that I played safe on that session, on, on that series of sessions. I played more like Charlie Watts than Keith Moon or Angie Dunbar. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to the bootleg Roundhouse or Hammersmith Odeon, any of those bootlegs, you can hear Keith Moon mixed with Angie Dunbar, which is me. It's my influences. A lot of Tom work, you know. There's a lot of going on, it's fussy, exciting drumming, just a three piece. But in the studio, I played it straight down the line. The, the speed was so strong. It was outrageous speed. We never had anything like that. Lemmy had probably had that before, but I'd certainly, since being with Lemmy in 74, I'd never had something as strong as that. So I played straight down the line and it would, must have been sufficiently solid drumming because they could record over it. Therefore, the original drums are still there. Filthy came and played on my kit. He replaced my snare drum with his own snare drum on my drum kit with my cymbals. Wow. Therefore, you can hear two snare drums. You can hear that one with a clune, and you can hear Filthy's with a clack. Interesting. I'm going to have to so really crank this up and really re-listen to this you album. Really crank it up, because that's why Warner's finally, finally went... Uh, you know, Phil Taylor drums on, uh, what is it, uh, was it something like 9, 11, 12, and 13, 
Lucas Fox drums on something like two, three, ten, fourteen, or something. Uh, two, four, eleven, thirteen, fifteen, or something like that. You know, the whole string of tracks, right. and and then you got Fil Filthy Taylor, additional percussion. Two, nine, eleven, and fourteen. So there you're beginning to get the real story right. of what always was there because the overhead picked up the original drums. Yeah, nice. And the original cymbals. On top of that, they did what's called technically an overdub. It wasn't a re-record. They didn't wipe the original drum kit. They it's, couldn't. Yeah. Because it was coming, it's pissing into all the over overheads. <laughs> right. and either that or they had to strip the whole thing down and they couldn't because there wasn't enough separation between the gu guitar and bass. So technically you're in a, you're a conundrum, you know the word conundrum? Yeah, yeah. One, wonderful, wonderful old Shakespearean word, conundrum, you're in a conundrum. My <laughs> lad, you're in a conundrum. It is a conundrum. And therefore you're stuck in a conundrum. You cannot wipe it. Either you re-record the whole fucking thing, which they didn't do because they didn't have the budget. Yeah. Or you record on top of something and the original is still there. Nice. Because the original was how it was recorded. So anyway, just a brief little dive into Rockfield Studios in 1975. And then we went on to do Hammersmithodium with Blue Oyster Cult. Oh, yeah. And there we have the classic. Absolute classic. What I was talking about, don't get me wrong, please, American listeners, don't get me wrong. I am not a chauvinist, anti-American person. I love America. I love Americans in general. Some of you I can do without. <laughs> <laughs> but some of the Brits I can seriously do, do without, including our present prime minister and all his gang. I can do without. So you can read between the lines. I can do without some of this crap because honestly we deserve better yes but blue oyster cult came on stage after us after our rough and ready on the edge riding down the edge of a razor blade performance which the audience fucking loved and i've got lots of people who were there who are now contacting me because they're going lucas you're writing a book can I tell you about my experience of the Hamish of Odin? Can I tell you my experience of the to two Mark Egan? Can I tell you about Birmingham Barbarellas? I was there with my young brother. We came up, the Hells Angels were everywhere. I need to tell you about, can I tell you about um, the Roundhouse, the first gig? We were there with our mates and Brian James was standing next to us and Brian James is a mate of us. So all my book is full of many camera angles on these same issues. As Lemmy, Larry and I are in the dressing room at Hamis with Odium, and I've got these flashbacks going through my brain of me at the age of 11, seeing the Beatles in 1964, and seeing I can Tina Turner supporting, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and seeing Chuck Berry there and the Stax tours and, and you know, and, and seeing, like I said, you know, Motown and, and, and Stevie Wonder with Ray Charles on the same stage. This stage I'm about to go down to, at the same time, you got these kids coming in from Acton, West London, on the tube, on the underground, on the train, and they come out of Hamish Station and they look choppers as far as the eye can see. Hell's, <laughs> angels, every, Hell's Angels everywhere. It's crawling with bikers. You can smell the piss, you know, it's, it's the dope is everywhere, you know, you can smell the grass and the shit everywhere. You know, it's like, you know, the vibe is electric. And they're buying their ticket with their, their hard-earned cash, you know. They're, they're young kids, you know, and they're, like, terrified what's going on. Right. They want to see Motorhead. Motorhead is where you have to be. This is, this, is the, this is the new thing that's happening. This is the edgy thing that's happening. This is kind of the hope. This is somebody who's retaliating against what's fucked them up. Right, yeah. And, that's, and, and therefore, I've got this double camera angle in the book constantly of people, what they're telling me they went through. And as they walk through the gate and into the, the audience, and it's a big, big fucking hall. I mean, it's with right. audience, a big one. Big for, you know, British stand. It's not, it's not, it's not a stadium, you know. Good right. Lord, no. <laughs> it's a 3,800 small club gig in comparison. <laughs> it's still a big gig, you know. 
and and they walk in and they can smell the the dope and and it, the patchouli oil and the girls who are half undressed and it's you know it's, it's, it's a real mayhem. It's a maelstrom, a female strom of, <laughs> of, of stuff. And 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 there and, and as a result, we're walking down the stage as they're walking into the audience. And that's the kind of way I'm writing the book. Cool. Cockroaches, warts, um, the smell of the, the the sticky carpets in the pubs, you know, the beer sloshing onto each other, you know, the people with with their hair going this way. You know, and, and, and the sweat flying through the air, you know. Right. I mean, this, this is what I'm writing. I'm not writing a nice, safe little biography. Right. I love it. This is not, this is not for the, the faint hearted. The Good. sex is sex. Yeah. It's steamy. It's real. I'm describing it, you know. You know, how she opens my fly, the whole, the whole thing, you know. <laughs> wow. It's erotic. It's erotic. Well, fucking right. This is how you remember it. That's life, right? It's the it's people reality. People do remember. No, but I'm sorry. Am I wrong? You remember your sex that way as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you can remember that sort of detail. It's yeah. not just. It's not like in the films where boy meets girl, go back to boy or girl's place, and suddenly there, there's you know you see a little bit of you know bare <laughs> flesh, right. and then you get a Vaseline lens and they're sort of kissing lots, and then you see it a little bit humping, but you can't see anything, and then next next thing they're smoking a cigarette. Right, yeah. Right, no. This right. is not like that. That's not how sex is. It is not like that. Any yeah. more than drugs is going, oh yes, we took a bit of this and we took a bit of that and we woke up the next day. No, it's not. <laughs> it's three days and three nights up with Lemmy cracking jokes and, and, and imitating Monty Python <laughs> and getting out there and, and getting to... And, and, and drinking special drews and that awful Southern Comfort, excuse me, Southern Comfort, but I really don't like your drink, but <laughs> drinking Southern Comfort as, as, as chasers to special brew, which is the strongest Carlsberg beer at the time, you know, oh, to yeah. take the edge off this horrible speed and the speed that you sniff in your, your nostrils and it burns on the inside, and your, your tears are running down your face, you go, <laughs> yeah? it's, it's, so that's how I'm writing it. I'm not I writing. Oh, oh yes, and, and let me put four strings on his guitar, and and we got in, we got in the, the the bus and we went out on the road, and there might have been a few groupies and stuff, and and then after the gig, you know, that's not I'm writing at all. I'm writing from the inside, how I can remember what it felt like to be a young kid, 21 years old, 22 years old, with all these these hairy assholes who I adored, and you know, Lemmy was was a fucking wonderful, very very intelligent man. Yeah, yeah, and very funny. When uh, when are you hoping to have the book finished? Uh, the French version. I'm writing the French version. You know, I'm bilingual, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so I'm writing the French version first because I figured that would be more of a challenge. Oh, interesting. I love it. Yeah. And, and so, so I'm rewriting. So I'm starting to re the rewrite of the book into English in about September, I think. Okay. And then finishing the both of them. Some, I, I assume the French version will be out in about... January, February, and I'm hoping to get the English version out in March or April, something like that. Excellent. And, uh, and then it'll be translated into German, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, you know, all the other stuff. Nice. Because um, it's, it's, well, I, I didn't, I don't think of these things like this. It's, um, did you get that book, uh, 1975? It's the first year of Motorhead? No, I don't have that. Let's see, see if I got it. Yeah, hang on. I'm still with you. Where is it? Where is this fucking thing? <laughs> there you go. It's this this thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Now, now that's. If you like the, uh, that's that's the beginning of Motorhead with with all the pictures at the marquee and all that stuff. This first tour, you know, and, and all it's a lot of the pictures from yeah. the sessions yeah. that you probably know already. Yeah, yeah, great. The, okay. These sorts of stuff, and uh, it also goes into the uh, the last bit. It, it goes from the beginning of Motorhead. I mean, this is very much like my book, right? beginning of Motorhead, and also, you know, how it came to be. And also, the last time I saw Lemmy, right? Okay. Oh, okay? Now, 
that's in, in November 2014. And um, I saw the band, I, I saw that the Siskin, uh, right? And then the Damned, who were both supporting Motorhead. And then I had my, as you know, my backstage pass. So I walked into the, dre the dressing room complex at the Zenith in Paris, which is a gig in Paris. And um, the guy who looks after Lemmy's dressing rooms for years, American guy, really nice, comes up and takes my hand, real respectful. Lucas, we all know you're here. I'm really grateful that you're here. And Lemmy knows you're here. It's going to take a little while before you see him, but he knows you're here and you're going to spend some time. It's all going to be cool. And uh, the bar is over there, you know, we'll bring anything you want, anything from the bar, you just name it. And the, the chef knows you're here too. And anything you want in the world, he's a great chef. He's got all the food you can imagine. Do you just ask him anything, Thai food, uh, you know, British bangers, anything you want, he's got it. You know? I said, oh, thanks very much. And, uh, and he turned to walk away and he came back and he said, I'd just like to say, and he grabbed my hand again, he put both hands on my hand. I'd just like to say, Lucas, that uh, everybody here in the Zenith knows in backstage that nobody would be here if you hadn't been here for Lemmy in 1975. There would be no Motorhead if you hadn't been there for Lemmy. He would have joined another band. And um, I'd never fucking thought of it like that. <laughs> to be absolutely honest, I, I didn't, it never crossed my mind. You know, I thought, well, yeah, yeah, you know. Um, Yes, I brought my, my little stone to the edifice and, you know, yes, it's true. We worked on, because of my obsession with the Second World War and I had all, the, all these reference books of, of um, Waffen SS and, you know, Nazi regalia and all that stuff. So, so we, 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 both of us, late at night, had our heads on speed again, you know, we, we'd pour over these reference books and go through the rooms and, you know, work out stuff that we liked, stuff we didn't like, the, you know, the Hugo Boss designed the SS uniforms, you know that. Yeah. Right, and uh, Ferdinand Porsche. Oh, yeah. Ferdinand Porsche designed the Porsche tank. Yeah, that's right. You know, the, 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 the Panther and the Tiger, you know, some of the best tanks in the Second World War. And, you know, so, so you've got all this, of course, Mercedes-Benz, Daimler-Benz, Daimler. Daimler-Benz was a Mercedes, it was a Messerschmitt 109, 110 engines. You know, just like in, 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 in on the British side, we had the, the Rolls Royce Merlin engine, which yeah, yeah. sounded lovely, you know, it's really sweet. And of course, it was a killing machine, a fucking ace killing machine. But you look at a Spitfire, the British fighter, in comparison to the German fighter, the 109G, and you've got the British Spitfire, for a start, it's a Rolls Royce Merlin engine. <laughs> Sounds fucking great. The Daimler Benz on the other side is <laughs> completely metallic, right? So you're sort of going, well, I know this one. This is what saved Britain in the, Britain, right. in the Battle of Britain. It's a beauty. But that one's pretty fucking sexy. <laughs> yeah. Right? And you look at it visually. You know, the Spitfire, it's got these wonderful, beautiful curved wings. You look at the camouflage from above. It's like brown and green. And it looks like the British countryside. It's really beautiful, you know, it's, it's sweet, you know. And you look at the Messerschmitt and it's like, it looks like a fucking cobra. It's got <laughs> these muffled, you know, it's got the iron crosses, it's got the swastikas, it looks mean. And it's got the wings which are cut off square at the end and the nose which has a cannon in it, you know. It's like, you know, it's, it's your favorite monster. Right. It's, 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 it's the, the, the epitome of evil on the other side and everything we love about goth and metal and all that stuff comes from these sorts of images. Yeah. Now don't let's get us, our, our, our symbolism mixed up with the principles and the dogmatism and the politics of it. Because seriously, the world has never known such horrible people as these 500,000 or a million Nazis in question. Yeah which we're talking about a lot of serious war criminals. You know, I mean, that, that's, you know, let's be clear about that. Right, know? yeah, I agree. And, and in my book, I'm going to have to talk about that because so that there's no doubt about that, you know, yeah. because there can be no doubt. And let me try it over and over and over again. Say, listen, my, 
my favorite, the love of my life was black, you know, and, and people still wouldn't really go for it. it, wouldn't quite get it, you know, because also I had a girlfriend called Ina, who was Latvian. Her father was an SS man. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. And I bought these black SS armbands, which are blank, because some of the SS divisions had them as blanks. And I got Ina to embraid. Oh, cool. In Gothic. Nice. To get to go on our leather jackets. Exactly the same as on the tank commander's jackets. Okay? So this is deliberate. Right, yeah. It's deliberate. But you can't get it messed up because this is this is to antagonize and also for the image. It looks great. It looks yeah, great. Yeah. Oh, right? awesome. it looks fucking great. You know, and, and Lemmy and I had a row about where to put the umlauts, you know, the, 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 the little dots. Oh, yeah. Lemmy, Lemmy wanted it on the first O. Oh, uh, okay. This went on for three days when <laughs> Lemmy and I were alone, right? Three days. And I said, no, it's got to be there because I did, listen, Lemmy, I did seven years of German at school. If you want the whole of Germanic world to go mur tor head instead of mur tur head, put it on the first. <laughs> I don't care. Right. It doesn't look good either. It needs to be in the middle. It looks yeah. much better yeah, in the middle. Yeah. 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 Aesthetically so finally, better, yeah. Finally, I got pissed off and I said, Lemmy, I got out a piece of paper and I got up my pen and I'd done art school, right? I did a year of art school and calligraphy and gothic handwriting. And so I scribbled down Motorhead written in gothic for the first time I did it. Nice. And I pushed it across the table. I said, look, that's what it, that's what it fucking should look like, Lemmy. That's what it looks like, right? With the fucking umlaut there in <laughs> Gothic. And he just looks at it and laughs and then, okay, you're on. <laughs> yeah. And that, that was the end of the story, right? Three days to get there. I should have done it at the beginning. But that's how Motorhead had the Gothic lettering. Well, and, 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 and to, I mean, not just the, 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 uh, the, the writing, the, the, the gothic writing, but I, I don't know if a lot of people know, you and Lemmy came up with the idea of the, of the war pig, the snaggletooth. You helped well, them define that, right? Uh, kind of. Um, it was at the Twickenham winning post that Joe Patagno, who used to do a lot of posters for Hawkwind, and Doug Smith, the manager, asked Joe Patagno to come down and see the band and try and imagine a logo. And logo it was and logo it would, would be. And Joe Patagno went away and came back a few days later. And Lemmy and I and Doug Smith, Lemmy and I sitting on a leather sofa in Doug Smith's office with Joe Patagno between us. And Joe Patagno takes out this big craft, you know, craft, Craft is like this, um, you know, the, the Warsaw Pact album, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's made of craft. This is craft, oh, okay? Okay, gotcha. This, this is craft. I don't know what they call it in American. That's craft paper, okay? This is what they used to send albums through the post with. Right. Anyway, he pulled out these, these craft envelopes. He pulled out two sketches, two big, you know, a3 sketch, I think A3, A4 is the little one, yeah. A, A4 is that side and A3 is double that, yeah. A, A, A3 sketches and one of them, one of them, one of them was the war pig. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, but it didn't have lots of detail that we now know and love. And let me just put his finger on it, you know, with a dirty nail, he went, that's the one I want. <laughs> and I just looked at it and went, yeah, that's it. That's what we sound like. And he said, I want a, an iron cross hanging off that fang there. So he had a chain and an iron cross to add. And I went, you know the film Alien? Yeah, love that film. <laughs> you remember the dribble? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's where that comes from. Cool. Roll, rollerball, the spikes on the head. Oh, nice. Rollerball. So, so they're the three editions, the Iron Cross, 
the, the the dribble and and the spikes. Right. And then Joe, Joe Patagno went away and did it. And the one you know is in fact the negative of the original artwork. Oh, okay. The original was 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 the positive, which is the other way around. Yeah, interesting. Huh. But but that was the first time that anybody in the world has seen Snaggletooth, bless its fucking socks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, Snaggletooth. Yeah, that's good it's, stuff. Uh, but there's loads of stuff like that. Um, I uh, I went to Piccadilly right at the beginning. I bought some of these. Oh, cool. You see what's in the side of it? Oh, yeah, you got the little wind up. Nice. Oh, uh, yeah. It's got wheels, right? So for me, this is going to be motorhead. Nice. <laughs> got a motor inside. It's, it's a motorhead, right? Right. And uh, let me hate you at first. But uh, so what I did was uh, this this is the remaining one that is, exists of the, of the three. I bought three. And the other ones I, I made up like model kits. I used to make model kits all the time of, of uh, American stuff. Oh, I just and, um, I Hang just on a second. I'm still here. I'm still here. Okay. Up oh, there you are. Yeah, yeah, there you are. Okay, so the other two, I spent up all night on speed again. I painted one in, in Africa Corps, which is the, the German Army Africa version. So it's like yellow in color with, with you know, the, 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 art, the, the cross here, you know, and, 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 and sort of bit, bits and pieces around here to make it look like a tank and stuff. And so, so I made that into it. And then the other one I, I made up into a, uh, a Northern Europe version, which was more this color, you know, more like the Messerschmitt color. So okay. I did two of these. And the original idea I had was to have uh, them to be attached at the back to this. So that as a result, the press would get receive a box, which they would open, and this thing would be charged up and roar out of the box <laughs> and drag that across their desk. <laughs> I love it. So, so that was the kind of shit I was into. And uh, I also wanted a, a crash Stuka. You remember the Stuka? Yeah. The, yeah. the, the plane with the, the, the wings like that, you know, the dive bomber, which terrified every horrible, horrible thing, but uh, great looking. And I wanted a crash Stuka behind the drum kit. Oh, and the cool. crash Stuka idea years later became, of course, the bomber. Oh, nice. So, so there's lots of little bits and pieces which, which we were just being so creative. We are out of our fucking heads on speed. And just like, you know, okay, we're going, you know, motorhead starting, we, we, we need to, you know, and we're just pouring all this energy in, but even before Larry arrived, you know, and, and um, all this stuff. And of course, Larry didn't want to have, he, he had his pristine uh, perfecto leather jacket brand new, and he didn't want to, you know, e even perforate it with a needle to, to, to attach any of this nasty Nazi regalia on it at all. Right. So, so he, he didn't want any of this stuff. Man, man, no, no. It's my leather jacket. I'm not putting any of that in my jacket. You know, so he's like that. But bless him, you know. He's, uh, but, uh, we were hoping, uh, Alan Davey, Paul Rudolph and I were hoping that, um, that we'd be able to uh, get Larry to sing on the Pink Fairies album that we did. You, you know the Pink Fairies album. Yeah, right? yeah, the, yeah, 2018, right? The, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's Resident Reptiles, right? Yeah, which yeah. I, wrote, I wrote seven out of the eight songs. Cool. And all of those songs that I wrote, when I finished the, the, the text for them, the words for them, I sent them straight over to Larry. Because I wanted to stimulate Larry. And the first two or three, I figured he was going to write back, ah, oh, man, you know, I can't sing this shit or something. He, he wrote back, no, this is great. I never knew you were so political. I said, well, yeah, you know, but, you know, we haven't seen each other in 40 years, man. <laughs> and um, and so, so I, I, I could read, because Larry had this... Um, he sounded like a South London Alice Cooper. Interesting. Now, does he do the the backing vocals on on Parole? Because it's it's not. There's no backing vocals listed, at least on my version of it. It just says Lemmy vocals, but there's no. But there's obviously other. You, you know, can hear it. It's yeah. Larry. You, yeah. Okay. I thought it was because it's, it's, yeah. it's a higher pitch. That's right. And and he sings. Uh, what is it? Uh, City Kids. Uh, 
And what else do you sing? You know, it's on parole. Yeah. On parole, City Kids, that's Larry. Okay. You know, I thought I knew Tommy. there was. Yeah. Yeah. I... But again, you've got the backing vocals on, on Leaving Here. Uh, and, and, and Lem sing, singing the backing vocals on On Parole, City Kids, as far as I can remember. Iron Horse, that's Lem, I believe, with, with Larry on the backing. And Vibrators, Lem and Iron Horse, yeah. City Kids, it, it, City Kids, as far as I can City Kids and On Parole are both Larry's songs that he sings, yeah. Um, you know, so, so uh, there you go, you know. But, but yeah, the backing vocals are the other one. Okay. Which is, uh, you know, yeah, so, so if it's Lem singing, it's Larry on backing vocals. And possibly overdub Lemmy vocals. I can't remember. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I was curious about yeah. that. And one thing I yeah. always thought was interesting. Well, I wanted to ask you. I, I was curious about this, and, and and maybe you know, maybe you don't know. But um, so the the you know the original version of of Iron Horse is on on parole, uh, and the guitar solo on that song, it sounds to me like Larry listened to a lot of Neil Young. Because it 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 has like <laughs> Buffalo Springfield era, you know. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, we're, we're talking about we're talking about Labrick Grove, like I said earlier. You know, Labrick Grove is the height Asbury of of London. Yeah, yeah. There's only three places you want to be in the world at the end of the sixties, right? It's height Asbury, Labrick Grove, and it's Soho in New York. Yeah. yeah. There's the, there are only three places. The rest of them, hang on, I'm just, just pouring myself a glass of what can you still do? Yep. I'm here. Still here, mates, you know, yeah. Right. Still, yeah. gotcha. still rocking. <laughs> pouring myself a glass of wine. But yeah. um, so, so, yeah, I mean, th these are the three places. So, of course, of course, uh, Neil Young. Uh, did you ever see, on, see Neil Young live? I have not. No. He was one of the fucking loudest bands I've ever heard. <laughs> even if it, even his, his acoustic guitar was deafening, right. you know, it's so loud. It's great. It's great. No, no, Neil Young, wonderful man, wonderful. Um, you know, of course, you know, and Southern Man, all that stuff. It's great. So, so, so yes, of course. Um, these things bled into each other. It's like um, the American bl birds bled into the Beatles. Yeah, this, this is a cool one. Um, What's it, Roger, Roger McQueen and Dave Crosby, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Right. And they become close mates with the Beatles on the first Beatles tour of the States in 1964. Then the birds come over to Britain and the Beatles and the Stones take the birds out on the town night after night. Because they used to hang out together, Beatles and Stones. Oh, Everyone yeah. goes, oh, you're both Stones fan or Beatles fan. Bull fucking shit. <laughs> they're mates they're mates right. listen the stones and the beatles would call each other up to make sure the other one wasn't releasing a single that same week <laughs> where, where, where you guys up to and, 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 and you know and, and mick, mick, mick and keith would go it's all right we're not ready for another couple of weeks okay you go ahead they didn't want to be in competition at the top end of the charts right very clever you know i mean it's really good you know yeah. but they're yeah. respectful for each other yeah you know when when mick and keith got locked up for drugs, the Beatles and the Stones did a single together. We love you. Oh yeah, I forgot about right? that. Yeah. Okay, to help finance the court costs and all the rest of it. The Beatles and the Stones were solid. It's solid as fuck. It's a fucking rock. Even these days, Keith Richards and Paul McCartney hang out in Jamaica together. Nice. That's... But nobody talks about it, of right. course. But anyway, the, 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 I, I digress. Where were we before I? interrupted myself so well <laughs> um, we were oh yeah there's this this is great there's so much cool information now i'm now i'm trying to Ooh. i'm trying to remember we were, Rod, roger mcquinn oh yes oh, yeah. Yeah, the birds. okay they are now very close the rickenbacker um on one of the birds tracks george harrison records a track with a rickenbacker same rickenbacker 12 string with a very similar riff i mean really similar so he sends it across the atlantic we're talking about in those days there's no internet sends it by post across the atlantic by the equivalent of dhl it probably took you know four or five days to get there yeah and and he sent the tracks to to the birds to say 
listen, is this okay? You know, uh, I want to use this. Um, is, this, is this okay with you? I don't want to fuck you about, you know. And the birds say, oh, cool, go, go, go. They call him back. He's like, no, go ahead. Sounds great, man. Go for it, you know. And they're feeding off each other. So, 1965, second American tour. There you got the Beatles going to the States again, playing 55,000 stadiums, right? 55,000 people stadiums. And they end up in L.A. Brian Epstein, the manager, has a really good sense this time round because the Beatles haven't had a day off in years. I mean, seriously, not a day off. Wow. Yeah, I mean, they're, 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 they're playing all the time. When they're not on the road, they're in the studio. You know, they're doing European tours, American tours, English tours, Asian tours, etc. Philippines, you know, they're doing, it's just nonstop, nonstop. If they're not actually on a plane, they're in the studio or they're, or they're talking to press. You know, you're talking about serious nightmare. So Brian Epstein, their manager, has the good sense to give them six days off towards the beginning of this American tour, the second American tour, so that they can just like chill out and lay back a bit, build up their energy. He books them into a villa owned by Zaza Gabor. Oh, wow. So, and uh, well, let me ask you a question. Uh, tell me how you got started in music. Okay. Um, we used to go to my, my grandfather was a vicar, like, Lemmy's father was a vicar. He was, he was a chaplain in, in the RAF who left Lemmy's mother when he was four months old and Lemmy never forgave him and hated religion and stuff as a result of it. My grandfather was a vicar and a missionary. So, so my grandmother and my grandfather were missionaries in India in, in the colonies. Wow. Anyway, so um, they're now in, in this vicarage to the north of London uh, where we used to go every weekend to see my grandparents, you know, get us out of London, get us out of the smog and the fog, you know, you know, some yeah. serious pollution in London in those days. And so um, there I am. And, and in this, I'm a serious asthmatic, okay? So, so I've got very damaged lungs. And, um, and um, so they put me in the warmest room in the house, the big Victorian vicarage, where we couldn't afford to eat, heat most of it. So we heated one tiny part, which was around the kitchen. And my grandparents had another part, which was right down the other end of the house, where their bedroom and their living room and stuff were. And they heated that with fires. But all the rest was great big empty space, like a ghost house, you know. Wow. Great fun, great fun as a kid. And uh, anyway, so, so in, in the kitchen, we had this big iron, wrought iron ray burn, which is a, one of those, you know, log fire burners, which is a, a stove, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that kept the place warm. So, so me being a very sick child, this was good. So, so my bedroom was in, in the living room, which was the kitchen. And in this kitchen, we also had a piano. So I spent a lot of time tinkering away on the, on the old ivories, you know. And my grandmother discovered me tinkering away and having a good time. And she thought, oh, yes, he's obviously a natural on this. And she decided I had to, absolutely had to be talked by her. And she was this tiny little redhead, you know, bright red hair, with a lot of fucking character. And my grandfather was twice her height. He, oh. he was two, two meters tall, he was six foot something tall. And she was like three foot something tall, you know. <laughs> massive difference, a very funny looking couple. My uncle, by the way, who became a spy um, in India, um, because he cried as a baby, they used to give him opium. So that stunted his growth, so he never grow, grew that much. But wow. I mean, these are sort of an, an aside. Anyway, so there I am tinkering away on the ivies, and my grandmother uh, decided that uh, she didn't like me making mistakes. So she'd, uh, she'd smack my knuckles with, with a ruler, right? And I didn't like this, strangely enough, as a six or seven year old. I didn't like this at all. So I decided, well, mm, maybe I should head for something like a drum kit where maybe they're not going to want to teach me things on it. And I think that's probably how it started. So there I am at the age of nine in 1962. Yeah, it sounds like a million years ago. It's not that far <laughs> for me, you know. Anyway, 1962. So that's, uh, okay, it's 66 years ago. But um, anyway, so, so uh, I've hung all these little notices all, the way, all, all over the house, you know. Uh, it's, it's my birthday soon. 
in February 63. Uh, I need a drum kit. I must have a drum kit. Nothing else will do. Don't give me anything else. Don't even, don't even go there. Don't even try. I need a drum kit. I want a drum kit. I must have a drum kit. And all these little signs all over the house. I drove them mad for like six or eight weeks. You know, completely obsessive child. And impossible. You know, if it was my child, I'd be going nuts as well. And so, so my parents, they, they advanced my birthday from the 25th of February 1963, which was in fact a, uh, a Monday. They advanced it onto a Saturday because they just thought, it might, let's get, get this over with on, on the weekend. Let's not do it on school day, you know. <laughs> it's not going to end well. And uh, I didn't know why. Anyway, so, so I, I raced down the stairs two at a time, you know, as one does at a very young age. Um, and it's my birthday, you know, so it's really early in the morning and, you know, and, uh, and I fling open the, the dining room and, and there on the dining room table is one box and another box, a small box and one box. And I look at it and go, there's something missing here. <laughs> and and I, I rip all the paper off and throw it in the air and, you know, and get out. It's a snare drum. It's pretty snare drum. Nice, you know. With, of course, your real skin, you know, it's not yeah. plastic skins and plastic heads and stuff. It's real skin. And um, so, so it's, it's blue mottle. It's like blue tortoiseshell type color and, and chrome. And, and in the other box is like a stand and a tiny, tiny symbol. A splash symbol. What do you call a splash symbol? Oh, it's yeah. like everyone over there. It's like, tss, tss. I love splash. They're great. But anyway, I wasn't very impressed. And I was, I was in a state of shock and I thought, this is wonderful. I've got, I've got a snare drum, but this is not a drum kit. <laughs> I'm missing all the rest, everything. I'm missing everything. So I beetle back up to, up to the up the stairs to, to see my father who's still in bed. And he's reading the paper, you know, this big broadsheet newspaper, the Times or something. And it, 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 I can, I can imagine, you know, they'd had enough, you know, and there it was, finally my birthday. He, he's like, the paper falls down, he, he just looks at me with his steel blue eyes, he goes, what? You know, and he's got a monocle, and a monocle drops from his eye, right? And he just goes, what? And I go, well, thanks very much, I'm really, I really appreciate it, I love the, I love the snare drum, it's wonderful. But what am I going to do about the rest of it? And he puts his monocle back in, and as he flips his, his paper back up, he says, if you're serious about it, you'll find a way. Plump. Oh, wow. So <laughs> I'm standing there with a blank sheet of newspaper in front of me and sort of think, okay, all right. <laughs> I'm in my pajamas, right? With my slippers and stuff. And it's cold, it's fucking cold, it's freezing. And uh, I'm with a scarf on in the, in the house. And so, so, so I, I I go into my, my bedroom next next door to his, their, their bedroom, my parents' bedroom, and I pull on my, you know, these trousers and shirt and woolly jumper and ran a rack and scarf and go downstairs and pull on, you know, thick woolly socks and rubber gum boots, gum boots, Wellington boots. Yeah. 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 You know, and pull them on and a, and a woolly hat and go under my mother's sink in the scullery in the, um, in the kitchen open it and, and get out the metal bucket because we don't have plastic doesn't exist in those days right right we yeah. don't have plastic we don't have plastic get out this big iron bucket and and we don't have sponges either you know sponges they don't exist in in in, in europe in those days really it sounds weird doesn't it you know it's not that far ago and, and so, so i get the the what the dish dishcloth you know and some soap and f fill the fill the metal bucket up with hot water and off i go into the snow out the back door of the, the house, into the snow, right? Shoo, 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 shoo. Next door neighbor, ring, bom, bom, bom. Yes, what was you like? Uh, I need to wash your car, I need to buy a drum kit. <laughs> oh, no, 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 go away, it's in the snow, you know. It, it, no, hang on a second, here's three pennies, you know. And, and you know, so it's door to door to door. And finally, you know, some of them actually said, oh yes, it's just there, you know. Wash, okay, you wash our car, we, we'll give you sixpence, you know. And so I can remember, because you know, I was little and, and cars were tall in those days. They were big, you know, they, 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 you know, the roof was up there, you know, so you really had to get up there and climb on the car. And I can remember this, this, this cold water running down 
my, running down the inside of my my arm into my armpit, you know, and the whole of my the right side of my was completely wet and glacial, you know, glacial. Oh, and it was, it was like it was running down around the leg of my trousers and stuff. It was, it was pretty horrendous. Anyway, so, so I did this for but about you an were, hour and a half. You were, you were pretty fucking determined. That's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're willing to wash cars in the dead of winter. <laughs> no, nothing, nothing would get, get in my way of my goal. Nothing. And um, so anyway, after about an hour, an hour and a half of this, I finally got enough in my hands of these pennies, right? These heavy Victorian, you know, not Victorian, but, you know, coins, old fashioned right. coins in my hands. And I figure I've got enough to buy a pair of drumsticks. Wow. My first real drumsticks. And so so I come back to the house and, you know, have a bit of breakfast and, and tell my mother about my adventures and stuff. <laughs> and she was great. My, my mother's a fucking amazing woman, wonderful woman. And uh, and Dickie, she's called Dickie. And she said, well, OK, you know. And I said, well, I've got enough to buy some drumsticks. He goes, OK, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, King Street Music Stores. And King Street Music Stores is right next to Hammersmith Odeon. Hammersmith Odeon again, Hammersmith Odeon. Okay, so we're talking about mythical, you know, shit. Now, yeah. How did you get into Mode Ed? <laughs> right? you know, yeah. it's, it's all the same sort of mindset. And uh, so we go down to him, Hammersmith, you know, Hammersmith and King Street Music Stores, and we push open the door, and it's like it's still in the snow and shit, you know. And and it's the doors in those days in shops had a a little bell above them, you know, it's sort of oh, yeah. ding -ling -ling. as you open the door, it went ding ling ling and ding ling ling when you close the door. It's freezing cold. And so I'm standing there, you know, little guy up to the counter like this. And I, I'm, I'm arranging my, my, my little piles of, of money here that I've just earned, my hard earned cash. And, you know, I'm putting on there, like, oh, please, sir, I, I want to buy some drumsticks, you know. And next to me on my right is a guy with a big nose and long dark hair. And, and on my left is another guy who looks a bit similar, but he's a bit taller and he's got a big nose and long dark hair as well, has a funny accent. And then behind this guy, there's like what appears to me like a really old guy, you know, and, and you know, with a kind of stern face. Anyway, I ignore all this. And, and, you know, and the last guy I washed a car for said, I was in the RF, you know, as a drummer in the RF, the, the, the Air Force, right? And he goes, uh, make sure that you roll the sticks up and down the counter before you buy them. Mm. I don't know why he didn't tell me. <laughs> it's obviously to make sure they're straight, right? You right, know? yeah. But, I did, but, but anyway, I remembered this, and this is what I had to do. To be professional about this, at the age of nine, I had to roll these up and down the counter. And so I did. <laughs> and these three guys around me, there's like maybe two or three other people in the shop, maybe a couple of girlfriends and stuff. That's it. And my mother and me. And these three guys like look at each other and look at me and sort of like have a little chuckle. Here's another one who's, who's on the on his way to hell, you know. <laughs> and it's like that. And then ching ching ching, the door opens, and I look and it's like two geezers who like kind of familiar, and it's it's Mick Jagger and Bill Wyman. Holy shit! And they. And they go, Charlie, we've got to go. And the old guy is Charlie Watts. <laughs> right? Wow. So off Charlie goes with them, with his sticks. You know, he's bought, bought a whole bunch, bought a handful of sticks. And then, so, so I'm still rolling my sticks and organising, you know, what sticks to buy and all that stuff. And having a good old time and thinking this is normal because what do you know at the age of nine, you know? Yeah. I love, yeah. That, I love that you said, uh, you know, that you lined up your coins and said, it, it's, it almost sounded Dickensian, where you're, you know, sir, may I have another? May I have a drumstick? <laughs> gruel, gruel, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. It's totally Dickensian, totally, yeah. totally, totally Dickens, absolutely. And and then then of course about five ten minutes later, the the door opens again, ding 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 ding, and it's Pete Townsend and yeah. John Entwistle, who's enormous. And they come in and pick up Keith Moon, who's standing on my left. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, uh, okay. Uh, and then and, and sort of see her. And I go, all right. <laughs> and uh, I think it's normal. You see, I mean, you don't, you, as a child, you don't think about these things as weird. 
Right. It's just like, oh, oh, this is a drum shop. This is what happens in drum shops. Right. You see people who are drummers, you know. And uh, and then about 10, 15 minutes later, as I'm, you know, putting my drumsticks carefully into in, into a paper bag and, you know, feeling really proud and I've got my first set of drumsticks. And, you know, ding, ling, ling, the door opens again. And uh, then we've got John Lennon and George Harrison who turn up to pick up Ringo. <laughs> So there I was at the age of nine, turning 10, in this worst winter. And it's the last time that these people could really be seen in public right. without having been mobbed by fans. Because we're in 63, which just at the beginning, Charlie Watts has just joined the band. Oh, OK. Yeah, because he wasn't. Yeah, that's right. Right. And, 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 and Ringo and stuff, you know, they're, they're just breaking through. It's just... You know, we're talking about right at the beginning of six. You know, so so anyway, beginning of '63. So you can imagine these sorts of events kind of sealed my fate. Yeah, I didn't ask for this shit, <laughs> <laughs> but I insisted you. on this shit. Yeah, you but I insisted on this shit. So let's, so, so, let's go ahead. Uh, sorry, let's jump ahead pretty far into the future with. I wanted to ask you about, um, uh, and I may be mispronouncing this. The is it the Midem Festival? Midem, yeah, Midem, yeah, yeah. Festival. yeah. So you're the the both the techno the technical director and the production director or program director, correct? Absolutely so, right. Yeah. How did you get involved with with that? I mean, it, it, you know, and so for people that don't know, this is a this is a French music festival. It's the biggest music convention in the world at the time. Yeah, and, it's, and like, it's like it's, it's like the Cannes film, film Festival for music. Yeah, and and how did right. you get involved? And I guess, I guess it was, and it, I mean, you had obviously moved to Paris. Uh, no, 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 oh, no you I was, did I before. Still in London. Before. Still oh. in London. Well, you, you've got to go in, in. In I mean, if if you if all, all got the patience to listen to this, we have to go in on this a uh, couple of prongs as usual, not just one. Okay. So. Um, I was put in the French lycée at the age of four and my whole education was in French until oh. the age of 17. Wow, interesting. This is because my mother was on the most secret base in England, Churchill's most secret base, which sent all the agents to Northern Europe. And she was the head of the base on the, on the female side, the WAF side, but operational not looking after the cooking, you know, right. but actually operational of, you know, put, putting the missions on the missions board and, you know, briefing people and stuff. And she was 23 when she was the commandant of that base on, on, on the female side. Wow. There were 2,600 people on the base, 350 women, and they all lived underground. Mm. And they only came out at night. Crazy. Yeah. The, the planes used to take off by moonlight with no lights. When they came back from their missions, they'd switch on the lights for like just long enough to get the plane on the ground. Wow. But that was it. So, so, so a lot of these agents were French. And my mother built up a real rapport, a love of the French. And my father was very into French food and French oh. art, French oh. art, you know, Van Gogh and, you know, Matisse and you know, all these Gauguin, oh, you know, nice. all that stuff. And, uh, you know, French art. So, so, so between the two of them, they figured they wanted to have children who were European. They didn't want to have a typical English kids with, uh, you know, the boys go to one school and the girls go to another school <clears throat> purple school uniforms and you know all that stuff and also there would have been enforced um sports and because i was such an ill child with my asthma it was not possible for them to think of me being able to play football or rugby or any of these things at all or swimming right. I, I just didn't have the i didn't have the lungs lung power to do it so um so they sent us to the French Lycée, and I went in at the age of four, um, a year ahead of the usual. <clears throat> so there was where I learned French. Midem, right? We're talking about the French music 
music convention in the south of France. And uh, we spin forward and we're post Motorhead, post, uh, post, well, just, just pre Sisters of Mercy, or, you know, pre Scientists, all those last tours I did as a drummer. And I started producing a lot of goth bands, which I loved, I loved goth bands. It was such fun, such fun. Goth bands, you can be really free. You know, you can do any fucking thing you like, so long as it's dark, it's credible. <laughs> Right. You, know, you can do anything. It's like um, Stairway to Heaven is basically a folk song that becomes a big, enormous rock song, right? Yeah. Goth is like that. So you can, you can get away with anything. You can try anything, so long as it's dark. <laughs> it's it's great. It. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. It's good. It's got to have a lot of death and, 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 and symmetry and, and, and right. sort of, you know, stuff, you know. So, so I, lo I loved working in goth because you're really free. And I worked with... Um, uh, Austrian goth bands, wonderful. Yugosla Ex-Yugoslavian goth bands in, in um, Belgrade and in Slovenia. Absolutely amazing, amazing goth bands. I mean, really a baritone to die for, you know, I mean, just fucking amazing. great stuff. And pr was producing a lot of bands in those days. So at one point, my engineer, who'd been an engineer in the bands I was in just after Motorhead, really good guy called Gary Hughes, who got into the business, in fact, because he uh, he had two choices in life. You know Chelsea football team? Mm -hmm. Right. He had the choice of, be of becoming a junior Chelsea team. Oh, wow. He was that good. And he, in his mind, it was Chelsea football team or a sand engineer. Oh, and wow. that, sat that Saturday, he goes to Charlton Athletic Grounds and sees a certain rock and roll band called The Who. <laughs> and that Monday, he'd made his decision. He didn't go to Chelsea. Yeah. Spin can... on 20, 25 years later, this same guy's going, look, what are you doing this week? You know, what are you doing for six weeks? And I go, oh, I've got a lot of sessions and stuff. You know, I've got loads of stuff to do. You know, he goes, no, no, you're going to be paid every day. And I go, what am I going to be doing? <laughs> and he goes, well, I'm going to teach you how to be a really good backline tech. Backline oh. technician. And up until then, for years, I'd had people set my drum kit up in Motorhead, Warsaw Pack, etc. You know, I'd had technicians around me to do all that shit. All I had to do was turn up at the sound check and then bitch about the fact my cymbal was two inches further away than it should be, you know. <laughs> you know? And so, I mean, I was pretty cool because I, I love technicians anyway, but you know what I mean? It was pretty easy. And then just get on stage and play your gig and then go and party and, you know, right. have, a, have a good time and get out of it. So, but anyway, so, so suddenly I had this opportunity to, to learn the other side. And it was fantastic because suddenly I was looking after a band. I was, I was at the beck and call. I was setting up, we were just three of us, setting up all the PA, the lights, um, the full back line, you know, drum kit. Oh. 12 guitars, horn section, uh, keyboard empire, you know, right. <laughs> those pretentious bands. And it was great because I really learned from the ground up how to roll up leads. And when you roll up a lead properly, uh, when you unroll it, you just drop the beginning of the lead. It just rolls out in a straight line in front of you. Then you know you've trained a lead properly. And you do that four times and you get the gaffer tape out and you go shunk, shunk, shunk. And it's like, they're like tram lines, you know. Right. And that's how that's how stage should look. None of this spaghetti shit. Yeah. yeah. So and he, he trained me that way. So I spent six one six weeks being really trained as a good backline technician, and um, and a few months later, because I'm bilingual, bicultural, right? Um, I've worked a lot with bands. If I know how to deal with musicians and management and production, because I've produced a lot. And suddenly I've got a technical know-how as well. I know how to deal with technicians because I've been one. I can, I can feel it. It's, yeah. it's in my blood now. It's in my blood. I know what it's like to work 18 hours a day and, and sleep for four hours and get up and do it again and again and again and again. Six-week tour, back to back, you know, that stuff, which, you know, extreme respect, you know. This, this, this is the real shit. This is the real, yeah. the real stuff. Getting on stage and playing a gig's lovely. It's hard work, it's strenuous and all the rest of it. But compared to a road cruise life, 
living in a bus for 25 years, 47 weeks a year, it's not the same stuff, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's less glory, you know, <laughs> less girls, <laughs> you know. Working your ass so, off. You're working your fucking ass off. And, uh, and, and you're probably having to deal with all sorts of stupid macho men as well. Yeah. You, know, technician, you know, technician side. You know, so it's that as well. It's, it's getting better. But anyway, so, 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 uh, so a f friend of mine turned up one day and said, uh, uh, listen, um, you've worked with bands and, and with musicians, right, for years. And I said, yeah. He said, uh, and you're bilingual and bicultural, aren't you? You speak French perfectly. And I go, yeah. He goes, um, and apparently you've, you've done some technical work. You've done, you know, back line and stuff. I go, yeah. He said, you know how to deal with technicians then? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I can make my, myself respected. You know, you bet. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, of course, of course I can. He said, well, we'd like to, you to come down and, and run the, the um, be stage boss and, and technical director of MEDEM. Would you like to do it? And I'm sort of going, a bit like the six-week tour, I'm sort of going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, this is falling into my lap again, just like Motorhead did it in its own way. Right. Yes, I'd done lots to, to, to get there. You know, I'd lied about my age to become a member of the Speakeasy, which is the club you had to be. And at the age of 70, I was drinking one half of warm lager <laughs> all night because I had no money, but observing what they were talking about, how they were talking about, how they were pulling girls, how, you know, the, the, the lingo, you know, the lingo, it's all right. changed in the 60s, it's all changed. Man, and you know, things are bad. Oh, they mean good, you know, it's, it's everything's <laughs> changed. And learning all that shit. And, and that's how I got into Motorhead, because that's how I met Motorcycle Irie, and that's how I met Lemmy. Okay. Four years later, after I lied about my age to become a member of the Speakeasy. Speakeasy so, so here we are, in the same sort of situation, where I'm suddenly presented with a, an amazing opportunity. Completely different from everything else I've done. <coughs> I go fuck it, yeah, yeah, fuck yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'll go and run your shows, and of course, it was a complete poisonous chalice because what they didn't tell me was that up until then, for the last couple of years, they hadn't managed to get their bands changed over fast enough uh, on live television. Oh shit. Seven bands in an hour and a half on live television, and they're all playing full live, no miming. So it's really on the edge. I mean, talk about back back to right, riding that yeah. riding yeah. that razor blade, right? So this Here is we right are, after back riding the razor blade again. <laughs> yeah, with a crew who were kind of a bit panicked and, and realised that something's up. So I'm having to sack a few people. That I just don't feel, you know, in my heart of hearts. I look at them and go, no, I'm sorry, you're going to just please, I'm going to replace you. You know, I sacked a few people, got a little bit unpopular, um, bought a crate, a crate of Scotch whiskey and, and awarded a bottle of Scotch to the best team every night, threw it across the stage. Wow. God, God help them if they dropped it. You know, <laughs> I mean, I really went for it. You know, went for it a bit army style, yeah. Yeah, and 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 I uh, I earned my respect, and uh, and so the first year I got it down from something like six or seven minutes between each, six or seven minutes live TV is a long time for a yeah. guy to you know, and soon we'll be having the next person on the show who's going to be and and then saying it in French of course, yeah. right. <laughs> but it's still a long time, you know, long time changer. I got it down to like a minute and a half. Wow, yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, so, so at last they were getting the, the main band before the credits rolled. Because it's not an hour and a half flexi time. This is TV. Yeah. One, one hour and 30 minutes and one second, there's no more show on TV. Wow. Therefore, you've add up the, the changeover times and the main band walks on stage as the credits are rolling, no main band. So right. none of the record companies wanted to give their bands to meet him. That was my challenge, and I didn't realise it. <laughs> so anyway, I, I had to get pretty hard-assed about it and crack a whip a lot. 
but I got it done. I got the job done. That's good. It's, it's really exciting. It's fun. And um, then they asked me into lunch. Um, so that was in January 86. And I just finished the Sisters of Mercy tour in 85, where I was playing with the Scientist, great Australian band. If you don't know them, hear them. The Scientist, Kim Sam. Yeah, I, need, I need to look into that. Yeah. And uh, so, so anyway, what happened was um, I was working out of All Saints Road, which is a Jamaican front line in Notting Hill Gate, and uh, at this touring office. And I had my production base there of, you know, going out and producing bands and stuff and had my, my answer phone and my, you know, people who'd look after my paperwork and shit. You know, there's was, was no internet and stuff like that. You couldn't do it on the road then. Right. Anyway, so... Um, and uh, we had uh, well, we had Sisters of Mercy, we had um, Screaming Blue Messiahs, we had the Cramps. Oh, nice! Fucking great, right? So, so I, I went to work with them as well. Um, we had all, all sorts of bands going through, and the scientists, and the scientists were going to do uh, support to Sisters of Mercy's six six week tour of UK, and Luanne, who is the scientist drummer, she decided. The day before the tour, she didn't want to go on tour with them. Wow. <laughs> okay. So my mate Nick Jones, who's who booked the tour, he goes, uh, Lucas, uh, fancy uh, getting back onto a drum stool for a bit. Six weeks, you know, we'll pay you all right. You know, I said, um, yeah, all right. Okay, go for it. And I played a gig at the Whiskey A Go-Go Club <clears throat> in, in the West End in, in Soho the night before with uh, the remnants of the Barracudas. The is oh, yeah. called Civilization Machine, Australian lot, you know, really nice, and an American guy, really good, good, good band. Is is really, uh, I think we played Search and Search and Destroy and a few, few, few of the Iggy numbers and plus a lot of Barracudas numbers and stuff. It's great, great gig. Anyway, I get off the stage and go to the dressing room thinking about you know tomorrow I'm on, off on tour with a new band. I've you know I don't know their set. I don't know the scientists in those days. And um, I'm sort of a bit worried about it, but I think, well, fuck it, here we go again, you know. <laughs> Here's another, another fun bit of life, we're just opening its doors for me. And um, I reach under the, the, the dressing room table to pick up my bag, right? And there's a broken mirror. And I cut my finger from here to here, oh, like really God. deeply, right? And I'm, I'm pissing blood, right? And I think, oh, fuck, you know, hang on, I'm going to drum with this finger tomorrow. Yeah. You know, there's, no way I, there's no way I'm going to be replaced on this tour, you're joking. So I wrap it up in a hanky and shit like that. And, uh, <clears throat> and the next morning, so I go to bed and sort of think, fuck, you know, wake up the next morning really early and go to the chemist, you know, the pharmacy, the drugstore, yeah. Yeah. and pick up some vitamin E. It's worth knowing this. Vitamin E capsules, pure vitamin E. And you swallow lots of them. And you also... You, you get a, a needle, you know, like a needle. He, she broke her needle and she can so walk in the dark, you know, a needle. Right. And, and you burn the end of it. So it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's whatever it's called. And, and you pierce that thing and you put pure vitamin E on the cut and just leave it there. All right. While I'm listening to the scientists' songs and I'm suddenly realizing most of the songs aren't even in 4 4. Oh shit! <laughs> oh right, all oh, right. We got six eight. We got seven eight. We got all sorts of. It's great, you know. Really interesting. This isn't boom chat, boom chat, rock and roll. Hmm. There's there's serious shit going on here. So so I'm thinking, okay, all right, okay. And this is this fuck is going to have to hear ill <laughs> between London and Glasgow, you know, in Scotland. That's the time I got to learn the set and heal this fucker. Holy shit! Yeah, yeah. So uh, so off we go. And sure enough, we get to the other end, get to Glasgow. I get on stage. And of course, I know the Sister Mercy's, Sisters of Mercy really well. Yeah. But they're not expecting me to be drumming for the scientists. Because they're, they're coming to the office all the time. They're from Leeds, right? Right. So anyway, they see me on stage and they think, oh, oh, he's joining the tour. We're going we're to give him a hard time, right? Oh, no. So this, this whole thing, you're going to have to read the book because it's really funny. Anyway. So, so I finish up that tour and, uh, and come back and, and, and go into the 10th anniversary of Motorhead. Wow. After that tour with, you know, with the white Stratocaster, you know, playing Adrian, Adrian Ballou style. 
Wow. <laughs> Having a great time. Come out of that, and then uh, this, this offer for me then comes up, right? For January 86. So, so it all kind of rolls in, you know, it's like things are rolling all the time. It's just like yeah. different shit, you know, different shit every time. And I'm still, I'm, I'm already producing bands in France and stuff. You know, so, so it's, it's great, it's, it's building. And uh, so your question was about me then and how I moved to France, I believe. Yes, but this is fascinating. Yes. This is great. But, but this is the truth. This is how it happens. Well, right? I mean, yeah, like, this all... is how this shit happened. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so, so, um, so I was French lycée, so I was bilingual. I'd worked as a technician. That was the, the two found fundamental bits as to why I could do it in theory. And the bit, what had happened is contextual stuff happening around me is the Sisters of Mercy tour, followed by, you know, the, the 10th anniversary of Motorhead and coming out the other end, you know, being offered the Medem gig. And here we go into January 86. I go to January 86. And of course, the Sisters of Mercy is just split up. Oh yeah, that's yeah. That oh yeah, that yeah. It was that time. W w Wayne and Craig and and uh, all those guys are just split away from Andrew. So just after the Motorhead tenth anniversary, Andrew asked me because he can't do it legally. He asked me to produce a track, which became "Giving Ground," with a certain James Earl Ray. Right, singing very similar to Andrew Eldridge, and that went to the top of the independent charts for three months to stop Wayne and Craig using the name Sisterhood, which was the fan club name. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, that's right. I remember reading about that. That's so I, I, I was Lucas Fox, I produced that fucker to stop right. the mission using Sisterhood. And they had to change their name to Mission. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then I went. Then I went off to meet them. Right after having produced that, and it spent three months in the charts. I went off to the meet them in January '86. Came back from meet them, and Andrew now, because of the success of Giving Ground, wants me to work on Floodland, the Gift album. Nice. So I go straight from meet them up to Hull in the north of England and spent six weeks with Andrew like vampires, working only at night, <laughs> starting at six or seven o'clock at night and finishing at 11 o'clock in the morning. Six weeks of that, with James Earl Ray for some of the vocals and uh, me for some of the other vocals, working on this album, which we then finished off at Pete Townsend Studios in Twickenham. So, so from there, I come back out and I go, I get invited to uh, the Medem in Paris. So I fly out to Paris again and I get invited to lunch to talk about the next Medem in 87. And that's all fine. It's I had a great time. I think this is cool. You know, things are rolling here, having a good time, doing lots of different shit. And down the other end of the table where all the posh people are, I hear this big fucking ruckus going on. You know, big row, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I say, excuse me, what's up, you know, and they go, well, nobody's programmed any bands for next year, and we're in like late October, and it's for the end of January, nobody has programmed the bands, and I'm going, and as, as I hear this, I, I can feel my hand is sliding past my right ear <laughs> towards the sky, and half of my brain is going, what the fuck are you doing? Get your fucking hand down. We're not going to do this. We're not going there. This is too, this is too hairy. And the other half of my brain is going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Let's do it. It's a golden opportunity. Let's do it. Let's fucking do it. And my hand goes up. And, and they say, yes, Lucas. I go, I'll do it. And that's how wow. I got the programming job. <laughs> wow. That year, I programmed, I worked from, I mean, basically, I moved to Paris straight away. And through November, December, and early January, I programmed James Brown on his first gig out, coming out of jail in his world tour onto my stage. Nice. Al Jarreau. Al Jarreau? Yeah, yeah, I remember Al Jarreau. 
Véronique Sanson, who's a big French star who's lovely, with the Tower of Power horn section. Oh, cool. Oh, great, yeah. Great horn section. Alici, who's an Italian star with, with Steve Gadd on drums. Nice. Kim Wilde, who's like English ah. pop star, who's just, you know, with the kids of America. I, oh, love, yeah. I love Kim Wilde. I'm a man. So I. I love Kim Wilde. And she's a great girl. She's really nice. She's really sweet. And, uh, and Rose Royce with Car Wash. Wow. That's a cool, right? yeah, that's an interesting, really interesting lineup. I love and, it. And of course, that, that's an hour and a half of dynamite TV. Yeah, that's that's some cool shit right there. And and, and I, I I programmed it so so well, and I, I'd organized my stages so well. It was instantaneous ch changeovers. Wow. Inclu including James Brown with 22 people on stage. Damn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Damn, as you say. Now, the biggest dam of that was the first day of rehearsal. They'd again built this really stupid stage with all, all these steps and shit. It was, you know, like pretentious TV stage as they were in those days, you know. And, uh, and so I can see something happening across stage. And I, I walk straight across the stage like that. And my, my, my left foot hits the side of a step. And I break my little, little, my little toe from the beginning of the toe all the way back to the heel. Oh, shit. Split open like that. Oh, God. Yeah, right. <laughs> first, first day of rehearsals, man. And I've got James Brown, Al Jarreau, all these, James Brown's 22 pieces, Al, Al Jarreau's 16 pieces, Veronique Ver Ver Santis' 18 pieces, you know, Kim Wilde's nine, you know, we've got big fucking formations coming to change over immediately. Oh. With the crew I, I booked and, and trained last year and shit, but it's, it's still fucking hairy stuff on live TV. Yeah. Oh, God. So, so, so you talk about me then? Yeah, fucking right. It was great. It was great, awesome. man. I love, I love your energy and the fact that you are willing to just, well, and it, I guess it comes from, you know, the, you know, kind of circling back to your youth and your, you know, joining Motorhead, you know, not joining, but, you know, forming Motorhead. Is <laughs> starting you, the fire, you yeah. got this, you know, kind of fuck all attitude. You know, but also in, in, in my own little way, yes. But yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, I wasn't anywhere near as, uh, you know, revolutionary as anti anti establishment as Lemmy and stuff. But yeah, yeah, in my own little way, yeah. But you're <laughs> you're, uh, but it's cool. It's because you're you're you have this obsession with, and, and if, if I may, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but you have you have you seem to have a a, a very strong obsession with the aesthetic, with sound, with you know, just, you know, pure rock and roll, which I love. Yes. I love that. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Where, the, where does that come from? Well, uh, that comes from that, that first King Street music stores and my, uh, you know, <laughs> running my sticks up and down. Yeah. And, and being entire, as far as I was concerned, they're just not other geezers, you know. They piss and shit and look stupid when they're having, someone's giving them a, a blowjob, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, but, but I mean, you know, we're all human, right? You know, when yeah. I worked with Ray Charles, it's the same thing. You know, Ray Charles, everyone was around him, going, "Oh, Mr. Charles, Mr. Charles, Mr. Charles." And I walked up to him, and I, I booked him for the fucking show. And I booked, walked up to him, and said, "Hi, Ray, I'm Lucas." He goes, "What? <laughs> who are you?" <laughs> I go, "Well, I'm the guy who's paying for this. You know, I booked you. You know, I'm Lucas, and I will never lie to you, Ray." He goes, "Oh, sit down." And we start talking and our, our relationship started like that because with Lemmy, it's the same thing. Yeah. I was a 21 year old, I was young, but I just looked him straight in the eye and went, all right, okay. I know who you are. You don't know who I am, but what the fuck, you know, what bands do you like? You know, off we went, you know, and then it's second world war and you know, oh, my, my mum in the, in the blitz, you know, and my mum was on this base and he goes, oh, well, my dad was in the RAF as a chaplain. I hated my dad. Blah. And then we started talking and we started talking about panzers and the tanks and the, the aircraft and the, the Merlin engines and the Daimler Benz engines and, you know, Kursk, the biggest tank battle, you know, in history, you know, 2000 tanks and the, the Russians had these amazing T-34 tanks, but the Germans had, had the King Tiger and the Panther and, the, and I knew all this shit and so did he. So we just, we were just straight in there, yeah. you know, it was like we had so much time difference. 
but there was this this complete bond yeah. and i'm not well you can tell man i'm not this macho man who's gonna i, I haven't i'm not this silverback gorilla alpha male <laughs> right that's not my it's not my trip yeah. you know I, I i suppose i'm my daughter i was really proud of my daughter she came to me and said one, one day papa i'm pansexual and i said great sounds good to me what is it she said, well, it doesn't matter what sex the person is. If I'm into the person, I'm into the person. I went, good on you. I'm really proud of you. Yeah. And it's, I'm, I'm not sexy, you know, I'm bicultural, I'm bi, bi, bilingual, but I'm not by anything else for the moment. But I'm not saying never, <laughs> you know, because life is a wonderful thing. But I've got nothing against, you know, gay, LGBTQ+, plus, etc. All of that is completely normal to me. We're all different and thank fuck we are. Yeah, it's you all know, about and, 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 authenticity, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, if, if, if the person's, it's about passion. Yeah. For me, it's about passion. Passion before discipline. If you've got the passion, you're going to do stuff. Yeah. And, and it's just a question of, you know, really going, I really love this. How much do you love it? I really love it. I really love it so much. I want to do it. I, I want to start, whatever it is whatever the tiny thing it can be, you start to get that passion working for you. And it's got this amazing drive. And then of course you start going, oh, but I wanna kind of make it work. And you go, how can I make it work? And you go, well, we'll patch it into place with a bit of discipline. And then you start using discipline as a, as a pleasure rather than a, as a teacher's punishment. <laughs> I mean, right. it's not. Yeah. It's not like you have to use discipline because otherwise you won't get anywhere. Yeah. No, it's you are so passionate that you're going to package this thing. You're going to you're going to hone it. You're going to craft it. You're going to you know mold it. You're going to you know you screw it into a, a, a fucking a thing that that actually does something. I love and, it. And it's passion and discipline, but not the other way around. So many people they get this discipline thing. Ah, oh, paradiddles. You know, oh, you've got to do paradiddles. Yeah, right. Oh, that shit. Yeah, paradiddle, paradiddle. You've got to do it. And oh, yeah, do your scales, man. <laughs> until they can do it, until, you know, then zest sleep. They go, mm -hmm. but they've forgotten the one lunar note from Captain Beefheart. Yeah. That one lunar note with a slide guitar, <laughs> which just makes everyone go, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, the, their hair's standing on end all over their body. They're going, Goosebumps, you know, that's yep. one lunar note is worth a thousand fucking blah, 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 notes by some performing dog on stage trying to jerk off and show us how wonderful he is. No, that one lunar note that makes everybody communally grow into this big bubble together and go, Whoa. that's what it's all about for me, anyway, for me. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Everybody uh -oh. else has their trip, but. But that's my thing. That's that's and, and I, I try to I'm trying to transmit this in some way to people. Because I've been through serious shit in my life. I you know it's serious shit, you know. I died five times with my asthma, right? I, I went to hospital and died. <coughs> and, and I woke up with a an adrenaline needle stuck in my heart every time. Jeez. Coming back to life, you know, and thinking, right. oh, oh, hello, <laughs> what the fuck am I doing here? And I, and so, yeah. and so I suddenly remember, oh, yes, I ate that piece of cake which had egg in it because uh, I was allergic to eggs. <clears throat> or, oh, yes, um, I was playing in the garden, there were six cats, I was allergic to cats, you know, uh, the dogs, I was allergic to cats, dogs, horses, and eggs, you know. So, so when you start life with a handicap, it doesn't have to give you a lot of strength. <laughs> because in some ways, you know, you're born, what is it? Born to lose? <laughs> yeah, I've heard that before. So it sounds vaguely fucking yeah. familiar, doesn't yeah. it? You know, and, and, and then what do you do? You, you kind of, your passion makes you live to win, whatever that means. Yeah. Yeah. I love so it. Lem, Lem and I actually saw eye to eye on a lot of stuff. That's cool. And the drugs were too strong for me. As you can <laughs> they're, they're too strong for most people. And Lemmy had an ex exceptional metabolism. 
yeah. put it that way. Because when he was when he was on, on, on amphetamines, he was pretty normal. Apart from he'd, he'd sometimes insist on we'd go around somebody's place, and, and if the if there was a little bit of flicker on the TV screen, he'd insist on on turning the TV around and taking the whole thing to pieces. Oh wow! And, and putting it back together again, it would take hours, you know. Oh, and he'd be out of screwdrivers and pulling the whole thing, in, you know, getting it all out, and you know, speed freak, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And meanwhile, I'd probably be, you know, I'd be painting one of my skulls. And of course, it was at somebody's place who we'd just woken up at three o'clock in the morning. They had to go to work at eight, you know. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. But yes, we were a bit crazy, you know, a big, little bit cray cray, you know, yeah. in, our, in our own little way way, you know. Not a bad. This, this has been fun, man. Yeah, this has been great. Uh, I, I want to thank you so much for for speaking with me uh, well this evening for you day for me but uh this has been fantastic um i really appreciate it lucas this was really fun talking with you um yeah fast i, I can't wait to read the book i can't wait for the book to come out so i'll be you know, i can't wait ready. to finish the fucker i tell you <laughs> yeah so we all need to be looking out for that um uh yeah any any parting words oh lots yes um for all those people out there, you know, you motor girls and motor boys, all you people out there, reach out to people who are alone in this fucking pandemic. It's not an easy time. But don't forget a little detail. I come from a land where, just before I was born, there were 35 million displaced persons in Europe. There were 70 million dead. Now, we made it all right. We made it through. We'll make it through this pandemic. And this ain't no third world war. We're all kind of united through internet and through what we're doing right now. We can talk to each other like this. We can touch each other virtually, I agree. It's not quite the same as real sex, but we're gonna have to do with this as, as best we can. And send, send love out to people and and if, if you feel that somebody's a bit <clears throat> under the weather and stuff, just reach out. S send them some stupid gifts. That's, send them a, a hi or, or a little thumbs up and how you're doing. And, you know, reach out to people. Because in our, in our business, there are a few sayings. One of them being, <laughs> if, you, if you don't lose your head when everybody else is losing theirs, comes from Rudyard Kipling, means you're a good egg. But right. the other part of that is, if you don't lose your head when everybody else is losing theirs, it may be that you don't understand the full enormity of what's happening. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I'd say rule number one: never panic, because it doesn't it doesn't help. Rule number two: there are no rules, <laughs> so you have to think outside the box. Um, I'd say worrying is praying for something you don't want. It brings it closer to you. The right. thing you don't want, the thing you're worrying about, you're actually putting it in your heart when you're worrying about it. Hmm. It's, it it's not gonna help. It's much better to just like stand up, write it down on a piece of paper, put it on the floor and distance yourself from it and try and walk around it and try and work out a way through it or around it. And if the fucking if the fucking mountain's too big, walk round it. Yeah. Because you know what happens with mountains when you see them in front of you, they're big fuckers. But you know what? After two or three weeks, and you look behind you, and that mountain is now a little molehill, way off in the distance. Remember that. Things ain't that serious. Walk lighter. Walk in your own shoes and walk lighter. Take things a little bit less seriously. And seriously, when I say rule number one, don't panic. And rule number two, look in the mirror and say, there are no rules. <laughs> and laugh at yourself. Take the piss out of yourself. You know, take yourself a little less seriously. Because if you can do that, you've got objectivity even in the worst times. And you can help people in the worst times when they're going through bad times. You can just spin a couple of those at them. Say, come on. Come on, you know, this, this, this isn't, you know, 
this isn't Al Capone era. Yeah. This isn't 1929 crash for the moment. <laughs> Touch wood. Maybe we'll come there, but for the moment, no. We've got the world in a serious shit situation because of my generation and the previous generations talking about my generation and we really <laughs> fucked the world up. But, but nevertheless, we've got the possibility of changing things. Because over internet it goes so fast that one little girl, whether you like her or not, from Sweden, managed to make the whole world listen. And all the world leaders just go, oh, she's right. Yeah. <laughs> she's right. You know, we should be taking this more seriously. And yeah. this little old man, Sir David Attenborough, who I've worked with as well, you know, is, is you know, you suddenly got this tiny little girl, Sir David Attenborough, who's like 84 or something, saying the same thing. And you're going, well, yeah, <laughs> you know. Midnight oil, you know, you can hear the things burning, you know, it's yep. right. So, so that's what I'd say as, as a closing thing. Just take courage. Let them have hope. We need hope. We're, this, isn't a this ain't no rehearsal. This is real life. Yeah. Freud, Freud used to say, think about death at least once a day. Hmm. And as Jim Morrison said, nobody gets out of here alive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. Right? So if you think about death at least once a day, going, oh my God, I'm going to die. This, this life becomes more precious. Because every breath you take, you know, <laughs> we can go into a police song if you want. Right. But that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's this, um, fuck. I'm, I'm just looking up there. Look, look up, up there. If you look out the, the window right now, you'll see a half moon in the sky. Nice. Between Chuck Berry, beneath between beneath the same moon above you, I swore I, I, that I loved you, my pretty Fraulein. And he was talking about the love of his life. Who's a German girl he met when he was in Germany in in his military service. And on the other side of the world, there he is. He can't speak to her, there's no telephone. And he's looking at the moon and going, beneath these same stars above you, I swore that I love you, my pretty Fraulein. We are reaching out to each other. You're in your time zone and whatever time it is, I can't remember. It's 2241 here, 2211. So in your, it's what, nine years, nine hours difference or something? Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, I'm so it's like- uh, Mid-afternoon. Mid-afternoon, right. Yeah, and, and we can talk in Australia, we can talk here. I've done podcasts to 93,000 motorhead bangers. Yeah, that's with, cool. With 400, with 400 of them sending in their questions. And I spent four and a half hours with them. Of course, of course. Because, you know, in the end, it's respect. Yeah. There would be no motorhead without you fans. I love it. I love it. When we walk on stage, that's, that's to get you guys off. Guys and girls, yeah. get you off. It's not to show you what clever fucking assholes we are. <laughs> <laughs> you pay good money. You probably worked in a factory or, or, or in a, some damn office or whatever it is. And you're dreaming of the, you know, when finally it all opens up and you can go to a gig again and, oh, and, and live, live for a couple of hours. Right. That's what it's about. So if somebody gets up on stage, he should respect you. And girls, if somebody gets in your bed, he should respect you. <laughs> it's the same damn thing. Yeah. Because yeah. if you give enough to the audience, they're going to give you tenfold back. Right. And it's the same in bed. If you give, give enough to a lady, that lady's going to give you tenfold back. And it works that way. Men or women, we should be putting out first. We shouldn't be waiting for the handout. We should be putting out first. I like it. Step up, step up to the base. I like it. There's no, there's no loss. There's no risk. Yeah, yeah, not at all. So it's, it's, it's far better to look stupid than not have done, than have done nothing in your life. So yeah. I, I prefer looking stupid personally. <laughs> it happens, you know. I'm, with you. I'm, I'm pretty good at that. I'm pretty good at looking stupid. So. Well, you look pretty good to me, pal. No, well, thanks, man. Uh, it's, so, it's Lucas, been great. this has been awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Uh, 
your wonderful stories. This has been a lot of fun. So thank you, sir. It, well, it has for me too. So, so brews and tunes, get into this guy. He's wonderful. Oh, this this has you, been a wonderful couple of hours for me. You yeah. take care of yourself and text me and I'll text you back my address so that I can sign that damn copy you have in front of you. I love it. Thank you, brother. All right. Take All care right. of yourself. Take care. Love you. You as well. Take care. Love